Well, hello, 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 and welcome back. Well, welcome to <laughs> season two of our clone army series. Oh, sweet God, my friends. Let me tell you, I am just so ever tickled and excited to be back in the clone army series. Honestly, when I just booted back up the save and seen our big glorious base, as well as all of our favorite characters, I, I had honestly put the biggest smile on my face, so I am excited. Let's get started. Now, in today's episode, we have one big goal that we would like to accomplish and that is taking over the world as you can see of course even though we've exterminated void we still have many threats left on the planet many of these factions really dislike us or hate us but two of them such as the Empire and the pig union like us I assume for destroying void apparently though the Federation task force that was captured and absorbed by void is still on the planet somehow so of course our first priority is going to be to come up here to this desolate little icy place and kick the absolute shit out of them. But for this mission, I've decided that we should actually send our Omega Clone Squad, our newest Vat-grown clone soldiers, they could use the practice. I've also decided to give this clone squad a bit more individuality so they don't actually have the same name. They're going to have names that are loosely based on the phonetic alphabet. Yeah, it's not very original, but that's what I did. And of course, I say loosely based because instead of like Bravo, it's Beta. Instead of Hotel, it's Harris. Yada, yada, yada. I, you get it. The hope is as well, giving them this little bit of individuality will also boost morale and bring them closer as a team. But of course, nothing brings you closer as brothers and sisters in arms as one big ass battle. And judging by the size of this last Federation outpost, it looks like this is indeed going to be a big ass battle. Even from our eye in the sky in the ship, we could see what little remnants of soldiers remain here. Shame we don't have any nuclear bombs, <laughs> or do we? Okay, so maybe we whipped up one teeny tiny nuclear bomb before we left with our remaining resources, but we want to go boots on the ground and have some fun with this one. The Federation began putting up a very futile fight by firing a few mortars at us and a few turret rounds, and of course this did nothing, even when they did manage to hit us. I must say that I almost felt bad for how pathetic and unorganized they were. Their troops were hardly coordinating any movements, they were just blindly running into our Omega Squad, getting mowed down by our blasters. It was hardly a fair fight at all, for them of course, but really is it ever a fair fight for them when the clone army is so powerful and so massive. Even a squadron as small as our Omega Squad barely takes a scratch on their armor. Ah, it is so good to be so powerful. And the Federation has been our enemy for so long, I always assumed that they'd go out with a bang, but it turns out they simply went out with a whimpering cry. Hmm, hey, I've got an idea. How about we give them one last bang? In the form of a nuclear warhead, of course. Now this isn't destroying the base, but maybe it'll destroy the power lines or something, or you know what, maybe I just wanted to do it. But of course, with the last remaining Federation base destroyed, we headed all the way back home with yet another successful mission under our belt. But unfortunately, there would be no time to rest as we still had other enemy factions to take on. This time around, we're sending Wart Wart and his heavy clone soldiers, as well as his sidekick Crimson, out to destroy the filthy Xenos, the Itakin, Attican, whatever they're called, the Furry Boys. However, immediately after landing, we made a shocking discovery. It turns out that these Harry Boys boys have nuclear weapons. Now, of course, it's not unheard of for them to have nuclear weapons, but I suppose we just weren't expecting it. The bastards immediately fired the large nuclear warhead at our ship. We grabbed it as fast as we could to try and reinstall it. We did manage to save the ship, but unfortunately, one of our clone heavy soldiers would be hit by the tail end of the blast and died. The blast also caused Crimson and some of the other soldiers to get heavy radiation poisoning, making them very slow and weak. Thankfully though, with the superior technology of Wart Wart's armor, he was not affected by this, luckily, because he could actually solo this entire base. And of course, that's exactly what he began doing. We could smell the burning furry boy flesh and hair in the air from his plasma. And it was kind of gross, actually. After destroying the immediate threat, Wart Wart entered one of the buildings, and this appeared to be where these filthy bastards were building their nuclear bombs. They had a good bit of uranium and plasteel in here. It wasn't much, especially with what we were accustomed to with raiding Void all the time, but now that they're gone, I suppose this will have to do. We began loading up what resources we could, but we were not going home just yet, as we had plenty more bases to raid. And of course, that is exactly what we began doing. We began taking on every single base head-on, 
around, encountering a few small nuclear warheads here and there, taking some uranium and plasteel. Unfortunately, we didn't manage to take any nuclear bombs intact or anything like that, but ah, we got some resources to build them. Of course, though, these nuclear bombs and the resources to build them weren't exactly on the mission docket, but it was nice having them. The main focus was destroying all of these bases. In the most notable battle in one of the Boro Forest bases, we landed damn near right inside their base and immediately began firing upon them and their turrets. Now, of course, I do say this was the most notable battle, but there still wasn't too much to really note. We spilled as much blood as we could, destroyed as much as we could, and tried to just destroy this base, essentially. And, of course, we easily succeeded at this task. However, we did lose our ship after so many battles and it sustaining so much damage, it finally finally broke. However, though, it was a pretty easy fix. We didn't build a new ship or anything like that. We had managed to make contact back with base, and Napoleon arrived with another ship to pick us up. Aw, Commander Napoleon, you're such a little sweetie. We began heading back home, and we arrived shortly thereafter with all of the resources that we had collected. Now, we didn't take too many resources. Like I mentioned, that was kind of a second thought, but we still had a good bit after it was all said and done. We had our clone army begin hauling in all the goodies, and I just kind of sat back and watched the colony for a little bit of time, thinking, of our next strategy for trying to attack these Itakin bases, however you say the word. I'm sure somebody's foaming at their mouth typing on their keyboard right now. Angry, I mispronounced it. And, uh, you know, I'm sorry. No, I'm not. Anyhow, though, some time later, Private Ox, our ODST that we saved from Void in the previous series, is, uh, well, he's up and walking around, which is a start. But it'll still be quite a while before he's ready for combat. We immediately let him equip some weapons, though, and then we begin prepping him for surgery, as we are going to begin replacing his body parts with some Void Tech body parts, and also maybe giving him a few serums. Now, this, of course, is to keep him from dying in combat, and to ensure that he can appropriately and efficiently fight off any enemies that he may encounter. But also, he's kind of our guinea pig. Ah, don't worry about it though. Look, he's fine, you know, for now. However, something that was not fine was the Void Planet Killer weapon that you guys have warned me might end up happening. Essentially, Void has activated an ancient device that will end all life on the planet, turning this planet into nothing but dust within seven days. And it appears to be about as far north as you can go before you freeze to death. And it also appears that Void has sent us some kind of strange countdown message that's very cryptic as well. But if that wasn't bad enough, we now have a massive siege of furry boys that arrive just outside our base. Looks like the Void Planet Killer weapon's going to have to wait at least a few more hours until we can destroy more of these sons of bitches. And speaking of destruction, it looks like they're already firing nuclear bombs at us. Great! You know, this kind of feels like karma for all the times that we nuke the shit out of Void. Thank God, though, these furry bastards are not near as accurate as we are, and they only managed to hit some of our turrets. And of course, Napoleon and Wart Wart immediately marched out every single soldier that we had to try and destroy the siege. And the plan was going quite well, until we ended up getting two large raids from the Itakins again, as well as the Wasters. But luckily for us, the two dumb bastards ended up coming in right next to each other and began fighting with one another. But you know, as much as I really enjoyed seeing our enemies kill one another without us even having to lift a finger, this really solidified it in my head that these factions cannot be left alive. For they can't even put their differences aside to try and take on a common enemy such as us. Truly though, now I see the truth, that if any of these factions refuse to bend the knee, then they stand in the way of the progress of the clone army, and they must be eradicated. As devious and vile as they are though, they did leave behind a few small nuclear warheads, which was perfect since we were running low on resources still. But unfortunately, since we are at war with all these other factions, it's going to be hard for us to split our army in half to protect the base and take on the Void Planet Killer, so we're going to need some help. We've decided to send out the Omega Squad leader as well as a few of its members to meet with the Empire to try and discuss a possible team-up. Besides, as it stands, we've yet to be at war with them, really, and they are allied with us since we have cleared the entire planet of Void. They still believe they have a claim on the planet, but we'll deal with that when the time comes. For the time being, Kid Omega is simply here on a diplomatic mission to speak with the Duchess about a joint military operation to save the entire planet. The Empire, of course, is literally the only other faction on the planet that might stand a chance against Void.
After discussing about the joint military operation, Kid Omega and the others began heading all the way back home, and it turns out that their mission was a total success. Turns out all it takes to bring everyone together, minus the factions that hate us, is a giant planet-destroying weapon. But now that we have an ally in this fight, it's time for us to begin our planning on the attack. Chances are, of course, this, as most missions against Void, is going to be very difficult. We, as well as our Imperial allies, immediately set our sights out on the Void Planet Killer base. And of course, we promptly began flying that way. We didn't even have the slightest clue as to what could be waiting for us there, but knowing Void, it's going to be something absolutely horrific. But as always, we would be ready for whatever came our way. And you know, honestly, from the outside, this Void base didn't look too different than any other normal Void base. You'd never really guess that this had a planet disintegrating weapon on the inside. Our two ships landed a good distance from one another, so we began gathering our troops together in one area. Shortly thereafter we landed, though the Imperials landed not too far away. And thankfully, it would appear that the Imperials have managed to amass a large size raiding party to assist us with this super weapon. I mean, hey, for a backwater planet empire, it wasn't too bad. We were fairly impressed. Sure, they're all probably going to die, but ah, we don't care. Besides, the less Imperials that survive this battle, the less that we have to conquer down the line. But as for now, they are our allies and we shall lead them charging into battle. As we all stood side by side, brothers and sisters in arms, truly an alliance like this has never been seen on this planet before. Void soldiers began launching themselves at us like lightning bolts but they hardly stood a chance against the clone and Imperial armies. However, as we predicted though, the Imperials were a bit soft and squishy, so many of them began falling down. Some of it may be due to friendly fire, but we won't talk about that. We then began moving all of the soldiers to the left side of the Void base to take out any remaining defenses just before we would begin preparing to take some rocket launchers and blow open their doors. Taylor kicked off the fun by firing two rockets at the plasteel doors and an Imperial fired a doomsday rocket launcher just after that. Unfortunately, though, the doors were a lot stronger than we anticipated. But of course, that was quite alright. That wasn't going to stop us as we had many, many charged weapons and blasters, and basically we just used those to blow open the doors. After doing so, we could see heavy defenses layered all throughout the base, and in the center of the base was the device. It was now or never. We had to make our stand and destroy this damn thing. We, as well as our Imperial allies, began flooding through the small opening that we created in the wall, taking out as many turrets and void remnants as we could. The battle was extremely chaotic. Bullets and blaster fire coming from every which way, mutants appearing in the rooms that we cracked open, it was hellish. But we continued to fight fiercely and valiantly. For the fate of the entire planet, our planet, as well as ourselves, relied on this. At one point, the Duchess was getting her ass beat by a Black Titan, but luckily he proved not to be too much of a threat, and we murdered all of the Void Remnants, and their filthy mutants as well. And together, we, the clones and the Empire, have saved the planet. And now, with all this done, there was but one thing left to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, you didn't really think we were going to let them survive, did you? No, no, my dear friends. Unfortunately, the Imperials were only allies of circumstance, and circumstances have changed. Unfortunately, there is only enough room for one massive powerhouse of a faction on this planet, and it is us and our clone army. The Empire shall fall just as all other factions. Because just like all the other factions, from the Wasters to the Itakin and whoever else is on this planet, they've already proven that they cannot work together. They cannot coexist. So unfortunately for them, if they cannot live with us together in harmony, then they will have to live under our boots. But of course, we're not completely finished here. No, the device is still intact. We still have some unfinished business with this base and with this doomsday device. Business that I find is best resolved by the two small nuclear warheads we recently acquired. As it turns out, that device packs quite a punch. Immediately after exploding, the device released heavy radiation and pollution into the ocean and land nearby. Although I do suppose that's a lot better than it destroying the entire planet and killing every living being on it. 
So, as I always say, a win is a win. But even so, my dear friends, though we have finally defeated and cleansed this planet of Void, we still have a lot of work to do. All these factions must bend the knee or fall to us, and we are about to make it happen. Until next time. Ah yes, welcome back one and all to episode 2 of season 2 of our Clone Army series. I'd like to ask you my friends, how is it hanging and are you ready? Because hold on to your teeth, we've got quite the episode today. We're going to be doing a lot today, we're going to be building, we're going to be attacking, and we're going to be making so, so many friends, many of them by force of course. But before we begin making forceful friendships, I want to do a good bit of building because Ward Ward and Napoleon throughout the entire first season, both of them being our commanders, neither of them have even had their own room. They've been having to bunk it with the other soldiers. And of course, the two of them are very gracious commanders and whatnot, and I'm sure that they don't really mind, but it would be a nice status symbol and a nice reward to them for doing all that they've done for us. So we ended up completing two bougie rooms, one for each of our beautiful commanders. However, ironically, after building these two bougie rooms, I noticed that for whatever reason Wart Wart doesn't need to sleep. It must have something to do with all the void bionics and experiments they performed on him. But nevertheless, Napoleon really enjoyed his. Now, I recently saw a comment by our good friend Dorella7420 asking me to make the clones a flag, and I totally agree. I think that'd be a wonderful idea. Originally, I wasn't going to do that, but now that we're thinking about taking over the world completely, we are going to need a banner to rally behind. And so, of course, that's exactly what we made. I I went with a fairly simple design here, a red flag with a golden trim with some imperial symbolism in the middle with a little blue dot and a golden star. Now, of course, the blue circle represents our little blue marble planet here. The golden star represents our faction and our main settlement. And of course, the white empire symbol is just basically our empire around the planet. And the idea, the hope, and the goal is just as this white imperial symbol wraps around the little blue marble, so will our empire influence, our power, and our love begin to wrap around the planet and strangle the factions that live upon it into submission. Or, you know, something like that. Anyhow, though, we still have massive piles of bodies, food, weapons, just anything that these dumbass Itakin left here in this massive battle against the wasters, so we start hauling all of that shit in, and hopefully we can sell it soon and make a little bit of silver. Now, while we're on the topic of weapons, something we talked about in episode one was trying to give the Omega Mega Clone Squad their own individuality, and I believe part of that is going to be allowing them to choose from our massive stockpile of weapons to see what they would like for themselves. And of course in doing so, this obviously means they're not all going to have the exact same blasters, which is going to give us a good bit of diversity as well as versatility on the battlefield. Plus, I mean, come on, they look super badass with all these new weapons, and of course with their customized armor and stuff. So who knows, maybe they'll even be able to intimidate the enemy to death on their next mission, which is about to happen right now. That's right, we're sending Kid Omega back out to the same Imperial settlement that she went to last episode, except this time she's not really on a diplomatic mission. And neither is her entire Omega squad, which now includes Ox, the ODST, which I forgot to mention a moment ago. Nevertheless, though, it would now appear that this Imperial settlement already has replaced the Duchess with a Duke, a handsome ginger fella by the name of Slade. Ah yes, we can't can't wait to crack their armor open and peel it off of them like a little shrimp tail. Oh, that was kind of gross, huh? But uh, nevertheless, anyhow, we are going to try and bomb them first. Unfortunately, though, we haven't made any nukes in a little while, so we do have some mortar shells that we're going to drop on them instead. Now, obviously, of course, I don't expect these mortar shells to do near as much damage as our nuclear bombs normally would, but strategically, if we drop them in the right places, we might be able to do some damage to the defenses and maybe even the soldiers. 
Yeah, no, looks like we're going to be relying on our blasters this time around. I did notice, however, that they actually are entrapped within a mountain range, so the only way in and out is by leaving the map or by using a ship to land, so they're kind of stuck in there for this raid, which is perfect for us. They all began to gather in this one single corner with some of their defenses, and some of them even began trying to mine out through the mountain to get to us, which was also perfect because we could just simply wait here on the other side and start blasting through the mountain until they got through. At which point we would then begin blasting them. Even for our smallest and weakest clone squad, the Empire was nothing more than child's play. Their duke would fall to us very quickly and very easily, just as the entire Empire shall, to the clone army and the might of Napoleon Wartwart. And by this point, you already know the drill. They kept coming, we kept blasting, and eventually we won. Now you may be asking yourself, Rat Knight, why do you keep using the Omega Clone Squad and you're not using as many nukes and stuff like that? I promise we will begin using more nukes and we'll begin using the majority of our army. But of course, the Omega Squad has to train, and who better for them to train on than such a weak, powerful faction like the Empire? And honestly, not using as many nukes against the Empire like this is beneficial. As you'll see, we traveled to a local Outlander settlement and we ended up trading a lot of the things that we collected from the space, things that we wouldn't have got if we just up and blew it all to hell. After buying a bunch of resources from the one Outlander base, we would then travel to a separate Outlander base and end up buying more resources from them before heading back home. Now the Outlanders do still currently hate us, but slightly less now that we're trading with them. The main things that we ended up purchasing were plasteel and uranium, the crucial part, of course, for nuclear bombs, the uranium more than the plasteel, as we already have plenty of plasteel, but uh, anyhow, we began finally working on some nuclear and fusion warheads again. And with our nuclear arsenal finally stocked back up, for the most part at least, it was time for us to make the Empire realize that they must bend the knee. For resistance against the clone army and our leaders would be completely futile. The Empire would either stand under us or they would stand in our way no longer. We do not wish to completely destroy the Empire. It would actually be very beneficial if we kept them around and completely under our thumb. But they're kind of upset about us killing uh, the Duchess and whatnot who had stood in our way at the Void Planet Killer, so we're gonna have to make an example out of one of their cities. We had to make them realize that their shattered empire was no more. The only empire that will save them on this planet is the clones. They had a few small nuclear warheads of their own, and we decided to let our nuclear warheads have a little talk with theirs, if you <laughs> know what I mean. Yeah, we bombed the shit out of them. As swift as lightning, our nuclear fire descended upon this imperial base. What few remaining Imperial soldiers were left immediately began trying to attack us. <laughs> you have to admire their enthusiasm, I suppose. But anyhow, we blasted the absolute shit out of them. We went into the city and killed the remaining few, as well as their defenses. And of course, the only thing left for the remaining Imperial settlements to salvage were the burning nuclear radioactive ashes of their comrades. And a few simple meals, it looks like. Those are probably radioactive too, though. But it looks like our good work here is done. Time to move on to yet another Imperial settlement. This time around, we will be attacking the capital city of the Empire. Yes, yes, I know it doesn't look like much, but Void did kick the shit out of them when they conquered the planet originally, so I guess we should lower our expectations. Besides, we're not really here for the city. I mean, we are, and we're going to nuke the absolute shit out of it, but there is a prize with within the city that we really want. A prize which flies around in this very bougie royal ship. A prize that is hiding within this giant plasteel structure. But just like a delicious holiday nut snack, we're going to have to crack the shell to get into the inner goodies. So that's exactly what we decide to do in the form of more nukes. This time around, we really didn't even have to blast anyone into submission. The bombs really did all the talking for us, thankfully, and we managed to save our little treat, it would appear. For you see, my good friends, the real prize here in the capital city was Prince Cat Low, the last remaining family member of a once great royal family on this planet taken over by Void. And with the prince's help and cooperation, we could swiftly end this war with the Empire in our favor without destroying them.
We headed back home away from the rubble of the Imperial Capital City with our new Prince Buddy. Well, he's not exactly our friend just yet, but I'm sure Prince Catlo will be uh, more than inclined to be our friend after a little bit of beating and torturing, of course. The idea here is that we're going to enslave the Prince. So basically, instead of completely destroying the Empire as we did Void, because Void was this massive maniacal evil force that couldn't be reasoned with as were the Empire is now completely crippled thanks to our nuclear bombs and are probably looking for a more diplomatic solution. We are going to be sending our new puppet Prince Catlow in as the last remaining member of the royal family. They'll be more than inclined to listen to him and they will be our proxy, our puppet if you will. And what do you know? Would you look at that? We are now allies, quote unquote, with the Empire. Just as always, Napoleon has them right in the palm of his hand. The First Order of of business, the Empire will now begin attacking these weaker, more pathetic enemy factions of ours, for we cannot be expending our troops for such low-hanging fruit. <laughs> that rhymed. When will they learn that the only people that come out on top on this planet is Napoleon and the clone army? The only people that win here are us. Conquering this planet with ease, and soon we may even conquer the stars. Yes, indeed, nothing quite like being such an unstoppable f- Hey, hey, what's this? Who? Oh, shit, that is a lot of battle droids. Hey folks, how's it hanging? It is I, your Rat Daddy, and I'd like to welcome you back to Episode 3 of Season 2 of the Clone Army series, where we are still currently facing down the barrel of a massive battle droid raid. There is a massive amount of these battle droids, as I mentioned. Their numbers well exceed 200 as it stands currently. We began gathering around the front of our base while the battle droids began engaging with our defenses to the north, and to my surprise, our defenses were actually somewhat holding their own against the massive amount amount of droids, but this wouldn't last forever, so we began sending our army around the side of the base to engage them in direct combat. The droids seemed to be quite resistant to our blaster fire, but their resilience wouldn't last because our raw firepower would eventually destroy them. As the droids began falling one by one, we received a notification. Another massive group of battle droids were dropping in right on top of us. Reinforcements had arrived. We quickly tried to put some distance between us and this new raiding group as we were still fighting off the previous raiding group that had arrived. And as the blaster fire continued, I realized that it would seem they were trying to beat us with sheer numbers alone. They would just keep throwing droids at us. But this mattered not to Napoleon and the clone army. Let them continue throwing countless numbers of clankers at us and we'll continue making countless scrap metal heaps. And as the sun began to set, we had taken on about four or five of these massive battle droid raids and they had seemed to cease for the moment. We stood on piles, nay, hills of these destroyed battle droids. 
Indians. But the fight wasn't over just yet as we still had many stragglers roaming our territory and even in the halls of our base. Napoleon himself would begin hunting down straggler battle droids on the inside of our warehouse. Unfortunately though he was all alone as the others were taking on droids in other areas. Thus when one of the droids fired a rocket and hit our nuclear arsenal and it went off, he was all alone. <laughs> That rocket fired by the battle droid set off two fusion warheads and three large nuclear warheads. It is a miracle that Napoleon survived within an inch of his life. Honestly, if not for all of the serums, his mutations, and his bionics, he definitely would have been turned to dust. Just as anyone else would standing point blank next to a nuclear bomb. Let alone five of them. And speaking of which, I would say a good 70 to 80 percent of our warehouse and the resources within were destroyed as well. If we had hadn't doubled up on plasteel walls to contain the blast inside the warehouse, we would have been screwed. Unfortunately as well, our resources of course were destroyed, but so were our workbenches like our fabrication bench, our machining tables, etc, etc, everything basically that we use to work around here and create things. So we're going to go ahead and begin working on some more of those and basically just trying to get our storage uh, set back up and to basically just rebuilding the warehouse in general. One of the first benches that we're going Going to be building once again is a fabrication bench and the reason for that is because Napoleon here after quite a while is fully healed. Yes indeed even after a massive nuclear blast went off and smacked him right in the kisser it would appear that his mutations, the serums we gave him yada 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 have caused him to be a super healing machine. But unfortunately his armor was destroyed in the blast as well so we're going to need to create him a new set and there was no one better to create this set of armor than Napoleon himself of course. It appeared to be a pretty simple black suit with a little bit of machinery and some metal edges. I'm not too sure what he's going for here and it appears he hasn't settled on a helmet just yet but I'm sure he'll find one he likes. Well, while Napoleon's busy looking menacingly into the camera, I think we're going to need to repair a comms console. It's been damaged during the blast and I really hope no one's trying to contact us right now. Hmm, that's odd. I'm sure it's probably nothing. We're gonna want to get that fixed ASAP though. In the meantime, however, we have a holy shit ton of battle droid corpses that we're going to begin deconstructing. It would appear these little buggers aren't made of much but steel and a few components. And I think we both know a faction that has an overabundance of such resources, so I have my suspicions as to where these battle droids are coming from. We've also located an ancient complex on the planet with some unusual radio signals and activity here recently. It is very possible that this may be some type of production facility for these droids. I mean, if I were an evil malevolent force that were building armies of battle droids to try and reconquer the planet from my old enemy, I would probably do it on this little island too. We plan on traveling there and trying to destroy the facility if that is indeed what it is being used for, but it also could be a trap. They may be very well trying to get us to leave the base so that they can send another massive army of battle droids to try and destroy us, so I had the idea to go ahead and up our defenses a little bit more. Now these auto cannons are nothing special, but as we've seen with the previous raids, our defenses held up fairly well against the battle droids, so this is more of just a buffer line before they get into the base and we have to fight them with our clones. Besides, it was better than nothing. The last thing we want is for Napoleon to be caught down with his cowl around his ankles. Speaking of which, it would appear that our comms console is now working at 100% and we are receiving a signal from the last remaining UNSC base on the planet. Shockingly, they're actually requesting help from the clone army. Now with the UNSC being our enemy and whatnot and attacking us on several occasions, normally we tell them to go stick it, but this could have something to do with the battle droids. Which also means that it could help us uncover the secrets and the mysteries behind these droids as well. So, we've decided that we will go and assist them. But fear ye not, my friends, we're still going to be sending someone out to the ancient complex. We've decided, of course, that we'll split them between our two commanders. Napoleon will take a squadron down to the UNSC base, while Mortwort actually goes to the ancient complex. Now, I realize splitting up our forces like this might be exactly what they're hoping that we'll do, but the base does have the new defenses, and we also left a few clones there, as well as our Omega squad. So, the base should be fine. However, a base that is not fine is the UNSC base, which even 
from the sky and our ship we could see was under a heavy assault by the battle droids. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Such a small base filled with solely marines and a couple of Spartans. They have no mechs, they have no space marines, and they're having to call on the clones for assistance. The mighty have fallen far. We landed our ship just on the outskirts of their base and immediately began providing assistance via firepower. And of course, if you know anything about Napoleon and his clone troopers, we provided a shit ton of firepower. We immediately began mowing down every battle droid within our sights. As the UNSC personnel began taking cover and firing like cowards from behind their sandbags, we and the clones began mowing through like a damn snowplow, except this is a desert. Anyhow, we started killing all the battle droids and eventually we had finished them off. And to our surprise, the UNSC were actually very grateful for our support. To think, that just one season ago we were nuking all their bases on the planet and yeah we're kind of the reason that there's only one base left <laughs> but hey we saved them since they were being so kind and grateful to us for saving their lives here we also decided that we would begin administering first aid to some of their spartans and whatnot any other personnel that were injured who weren't already dead of course you know guys i know that we hate the unsc and the unsc hates us but this could be the very very a teeny tiny trickling start of a most beautiful friendship in the galaxy. But I suppose only time will tell if this will amount to anything. In the meantime though, Wartward and his squad are still on their way to the ancient complex to hopefully see if there's any useful information there about the battle droids or just basically to see what horrors await within. After arriving, the complex did indeed seem ancient except for the fencing which appeared to be basically brand new and built here recently. It was a very large complex as well. And I wish I could tell you that we were surprised to see battle droids guarding the entrances of said complex, but we weren't surprised at all. We kind of assumed our intel was correct, as it normally is, of course. But of course, the only way to tell what is truly going on within this complex is going to be for us to crack it open and take a look. Ah yes, yet another beautiful planet in RimWorld to settle on. Shame that it's... Infected. We're starting with a handsome gentleman in a suit named Willis, who happened to be a coma child and grew up to be a human computer. He's kind, but also a pessimist. Two of the main mods that we're going to be using here are Rim Cities and Fog of War. This is really going to set the atmosphere and make things really interesting, yet a little bit spooky. Now of course, not only are these cities going to be filled with brain-hungry, bloodthirsty zombies, they're also going to be filled with survival, raiders, people who also want to kill us. But mostly zombies, of course. Willis and I started just on the outskirts of one of these abandoned looking cities and we began looking around before we began making our way inside. After entering our first building, we decided to tear down one of the wooden walls to arm ourselves. Truthfully though, I didn't think a piece of wood was going to cut it, but I guess we'll make do with what we have. Unfortunately though, immediately after going through the next door, we encountered a waster pirate who chased us down and ended up stabbing us to death. Yes, yeah, so it turns out I'm not very good at this. But that's okay though, that's how we learn. I immediately went back to the main menu and started cooking up another planet for us to try this on. And this time around, we're going to be using our good buddy Vance, but first he needs a handsome suit. Ah, that's much better, my little buddy. <laughs> He's going to die. But first, before that happens, let's take a look at those stats. Ah, very mediocre for the most part. He was a video gamer child and a ballet dancer who is very pretty. Well, now the only thing left to do with him is start entering buildings willy-nilly again and hope that he survives. And for the most part, it was kind of working. We found a corpse with some armor, so we stripped him, put that on, and he also had some Twinkies, which was cool. We went room to room, clearing them out, just making sure it was only us here, and then we began tearing down some metal walls. That way, we would have enough material to make a knife. But while we were doing that, it would appear that the townspeople were having a few issues of their own. We didn't worry too much about it, though, and just stayed in our nice little abandoned building for the night minding our own business. I got a little eager and started tearing up the wooden floorboards in hopes we would get enough material to make a short bow, but Vance got a little bit sleepy and had to take a nap. The next day we woke up and had a few Twinkies for breakfast and then continued our glorious work on our wooden short bow. After that though I decided that we should start exploring a bit more of the city, so we went to an adjacent building and just went room to room looking to see if there was anything useful or if there were any zombies, etc, etc. We didn't find any zombies, thank God, 
Uh, but we did end up finding a game of Ur, which was perfect because Vance needed to do a little bit of recreation. In the next room we checked, we ended up finding a mule and a dromedary in the same room doing something, but we also found a psychic shock lance, which might be useful if we find any raiders. We finished up the rest of the building, and it was pretty nice. It was a large building with plenty of escape routes, so I said to myself, you know, a fella could get used to this. We ended up building a table. Then we sat down at said table and had our very first simple meal. I think we'll make this our base of operations for the time being. I also deconstructed some of the steel furniture and ended up using said steel to make us a bed, which ended up being stupid because apparently the map is littered with beds, but I didn't find that out until later. The very next day after Vance woke up and had a little meal, it was time for us to go gallivanting around once again, and this is where the beds come into play. I found so many damn beds in some of these abandoned buildings, but I also ended up finding a dresser as well as an end table. The beds were slightly better quality than the one that Vance had built, so we had brought that back to our base, as well as an end table and the dresser, of course. However, I had still yet to see one single zombie and or a raider. I did, however, find this guy wandering around inside our building. His name was Mahoney, and he was apparently a slave of the faction that owned this city. I, don't, I think they, they were a friendly faction, so he was okay, I guess. We did, however, sleep with one eye open, just in case Mahoney tried to sneak up and stab us in the back for a stash of twinkies. Keys. The next morning, we began moving around, building to building, looking around once again, but then we saw it, our very first zombie, and it scared the shit out of me. I realized, though, I could see its location by the red sound waves coming off of it, and we snuck by it. We then continued sneaking all throughout the city in the hopes that we would be able to find some food, and luckily we ended up finding some Twinkies next to a pile of blood. I then began going through other buildings, trying to see what I could find, and stumbled across more zombies, which once again scared the shit out of me. And now look, I know what you're thinking, Ragnar, you're being ridiculous, have you never played this mod before, blah blah blah. I've actually never used these mods before at all, especially not in this combination, so it, it was uh, very interesting for me, and also very scary. Something else that was was very scary for me is going through another building finding a bunch more zombies within a room and then they run out to attack me but then begin tearing apart poor Mahoney. Luckily though we got away scot-free and we also managed to score some more simple meals and take them back to base. We also managed to nab a sweet ass poker table and take back to our room so we could play poker all by ourselves. I did, however, notice Vance in the corner of his room at one point, and it appeared that he was praying, which is probably the best thing that he could do, given the situation that he's in for sure. But out of fears that Vance would end up dying to some zombies or something like that, I decided to quarantine him in his room for the rest of the night. Then once the sun came up, we decided to wake Vance up, send him back out, and just start kind of adventuring around again, looking for food, and really something we'd been looking for this entire time was a new weapon, and we had finally found one. It was a a really low quality garbage LMG lying in a pool of blood, but hey, it was an LMG nonetheless, and it was better than our short bow. We then had Vance continue his search throughout the city. There wasn't really anything interesting to mention except for a few zombie sightings, maybe. We circled back around though, grabbed some fine meals, and went back home once again. The very next day though, we ended up encountering a zombie once again, and we had to engage it this time. It chased us out of the room and had caused us to drop our LMG that we had just found, but we managed to circle back to that room, grab the LMG, and then start shooting at it. And just like that, in the blink of an eye and a few pulls from an LMG's trigger, Vance was now an undead slayer, unmatched within the city, as far as we know. Just after this though, we went to a nearby building and started deconstructing a biofuel refinery. The reason being is we needed components because I had hoped to use those components and some steel to make a wood-fired generator. Oh, and uh, we also had this chicken wandering around in our building, and we didn't have any food, so... Now look, I know him eating a corpse doesn't seem very important, or at least not important enough to show you, but trust me, this is important. Yet again though, we were out on more escapades out in the town, gallivanting around in the city as we always do, looking for useful goodies and resources to try and better ourselves in this hellish zombie apocalypse city. Due to the lack of food though, we had to harvest some berries, during which time a zombie actually snuck up on us and almost got us. Luckily though, the rat daddy saw it just in time, Vance whipped out the machine gun and took him down. 
We would then continue searching building to building, encountering zombies along the way, yada yada, the same shit you've already seen. At one point though, we ended up clearing out a very large building, and just down this long hallway we could see a massive stack of components, just what we needed. We immediately dropped everything else we were thinking of doing, grabbed the components, and began heading back home. Unfortunately for us though, on the way back home, Vance spotted a zombie and immediately started firing at it because it was running at him. Of course, something any reasonable person would do, but we would need to shake this zombie off our trail if we were going to make it back home with all of our limbs and just as well our stack of components that we desperately wanted and needed. I tried to give the zombies the slip by uh, making a bit of a U-turn through some other buildings we'd already went through and coming back around to grab the components, but as he was walking away with the stack of components, Vance went into a daze. You remember how we talked about him eating that chicken corpse, right? Apparently that was the last straw. I have made what we in the business call an oopsie daisy. Unfortunately, really the only thing I could think to do, really the only thing that I could do with Vance being in a dazed state is sit around, wait for him to stand in the rain and eventually zombies would get him. Or they wouldn't, I had hoped, but they did. However, even in his dazed state, he was still trying to defend himself with his knife. Uh, he didn't pull out the LMG, which basically would have saved his life, but he was trying, so I thought, oh my god, there may still be a teeny tiny glimmer of hope. Eh, but no. Unfortunately, Vance was now going to be torn apart by two zombies and a puma, as you'll see in just a moment. Not a zombie or undead puma, just a normal puma. Well, hello, how is it hanging, my lovely friends? It is I, your rat daddy, and today I bring you episode four of season two of the Clone Army series. And as I sit here and narrate to you, my friends, Wart Wart and his squadron are awaiting the perfect time to infiltrate the ancient complex that we very well believe may be a staging ground or an assembly building for the new battle droids that we've been facing the last few episodes. But of course, naturally, there is only one way to find out. It's time for us to kick in some teeth and kick in some doors in that order. We very quickly and easily took out the few battle droids guarding the front of the base and then we checked out these doors to see which ones led where. Three of the doors went nowhere and then one of them had to be the correct one. Of course though, we wanted to enter the building with style and pizzazz, so we chucked about 55 grenades at it until it finally exploded and turned to dust. Crimson and the heavy clones would then enter the building. Then of course, following closely behind was Wart Wart and the other clones that had come with us. They all crammed and crowded into this very dense and narrow hallway and began preparing to infiltrate the main part of the complex. This time around, Wart Wart would use his blasters to completely melt through the plasteel door like butter. Then they all quickly infiltrated the base, taking out any droids and turrets they saw. After doing so though, we found a power source in the corner of the room. It was just as we had suspected, void powers Cells. It appears that remnants of our old arch nemesis are building these droids and sending to our base as well as the other factions that are allied with us to try and take back their planet. But it'll take more than a few walking chunks of metal to stop us. It's about high time we start clearing out the rest of this base, killing any void remnants and battle droids that we find here. As the battle rages on though, I find myself wondering just how many of these assembly buildings are still left on the planet. There could be many other ancient complexes or other outposts and buildings that actually contain void droid assembly buildings. I do find it interesting though because after destroying all of these battle droids and the void associates as well as the turrets, we began trying to clear out the rest of this massive ancient complex and it appears that only a few of the rooms within the ancient complex were actually being used by void so they must have recently set up shop here. However, we've yet to detect any void ships coming to or from the planet so it was hard for us to understand really how they were getting their resources until we noticed this machine in the middle of the room. Of all people, Crimson said that he was familiar with this technology and that it was some type of teleportation device. He said he would check out the machine and see if he could pinpoint the last coordinates to find out where the void resources and associates and whatnot were coming from. Oh shit, somehow I don't think that's what was supposed to happen. It would appear that Crimson's been sucked into a portal or teleported or something. All we really know right now is that he's gone and we should probably take this machine back to base to see what we can figure out and how we can get Crimson back. So Ward Ward and his crew loaded everything back up into their ship and began making the long trip all the way back home to the mainland to our base. Meanwhile, Napoleon and his squad were still at the UNSC base that they had saved tending to their personnel 
as a pelican was landing just overhead. They appeared to be UNSC reinforcements, but upon further inspection and after speaking with their corporal named Haley, it looks like they were actually a search and rescue party. The corporal then began questioning Napoleon about an ODST that was actually part of her brother's squad on a different planet to see if he knew anything about it, but Napoleon didn't have time for any of that because Wart Wart was contacting him to explain that there was an urgent matter that needed his attention. So we ended up leaving the UNSC base and Corporal Haley to her own devices and uh, we began heading all the way back home to see what was going on. Shortly after landing, Wart Wart began speaking with Napoleon about the situation with Crimson getting sucked into a black hole like portal. We don't know if he's alive or dead, but we decided that we we're going to try and set up this machine and work with it to see if there's some way we could bring him back or just find him. Now, unfortunately, we didn't have a Void Tech terminal, but we did have a UNSC terminal and we ended up having Spartan Taylor and Private Ox who were very familiar with such technologies. Private Ox said he had a lot of experience with UNSC warp drives, which is kind of the same thing, so we let him lead the charge on this one. But now, of course, while the Private is working on the teleportation device, we still have quite a bit of work to do here around the base. Since we've turned the Empire of this planet into something of a puppet and or proxy, it's probably about high time we at least get started on focusing on the stars. Now, to go about doing so, we're going to need much bigger ships. We're going to need a ship that is capable of intergalactic travel. Now, we do have plenty of ships that are capable of traveling through space and whatnot, but not intergalactically. You see, that is the key. Now, I do have a ship in mind that is definitely capable of doing such, and it is the Hammerhead Cruiser, but it is a little bit too big, as you can see. Okay, yeah, so it's absolutely massive. I mean, it is a gargantuan ship. And another thing with this ship is it takes a holy shit ton of resources, most of which we don't currently have. As it stands currently, I don't think we have a fraction of the steel or cloth it would take to build this ship, which is definitely something that we're going to have to begin working on as well. But something else that we need to work on for this ship is where we're going to put it. Now, of course, we could just build it somewhere on the map where there's a lot of trees and dirt, no walls, just kind of away from the base. But as we've seen time and time again, anything outside our walls, and really anything inside our walls, is not fully protected at all. But of course, having the ship in a newly built section of our base is going to be a lot safer than building it outside of the walls, so that's exactly what we're going to do. And I very, very, very desperately do not want to build this massive, expensive starship just to have it destroyed and us to have to collect all the resources again, preferably. Speaking of said resources, though, we ended up having a bulk goods trade ship in the atmosphere, and we began trading with them to try and obtain some of the cloth that they have, as well as the steel, the two things that we really need for this massive ship. Realistically, though, we have plenty of money to buy steel and cloth, and we can always mine steel as well, but this was nothing but a drop in the bucket for the gargantuan amount that it's going to take to build this ship. So we decided that we would also try and trade with some of the nearby settlements, the Outlanders, the Pig Union, etc., etc. And so that's basically exactly what we did, at least for a good amount of time. I just traveled from one settlement to another, purchasing steel and cloth and a little bit of uranium, because we still need to make some nuclear bombs, of course, and also a teeny tiny bit of chem fuel, but it wasn't a big deal because they always wanted to buy advanced components for their machinery, which are very expensive, and we had a whole heaping shit ton of them from all our fights with Void. Not that we really had any issue using silver for bartering and whatnot either. We had a whole bunch of silver. We had plenty of components. We, we, you already know we have all the resources we could ever need, except for steel and cloth, apparently. But all that work, all that trading, even after all that, this was still barely a fraction of what we needed. So we're going to have to do quite a bit of trading. Now, of course, though, we're going to need somewhere to put all these damn resources. Ever since that nuclear bomb exploded in our warehouse, we've been very messy and organized. So I decided to sit back, eat a little bit of lunch, maybe drink a cold Dr. Pepper, not sponsored, and just kind of watch our clones clean up the warehouse and just kind of organize everything in the base. But as I sit here and enjoy my little sandwich on lunch and my ice cold Dr. Pepper, not sponsored once again, I get sick of looking at Napoleon's bare 
face. We need to put a mask on that thing. I looked through the workshop looking for different types of masks and whatnot that I thought would go good for Napoleon. I don't want to use the Darth Vader mask or the uh, Darth Raven mask or anything like that because it just doesn't feel unique enough to me. We need Napoleon his own mask. And at the end of the day, I was pretty happy because I ended up going with a more simple look for Napoleon. Instead of an actual helmet as a mask, we ended up just giving him a simple breather mask. And honestly, I think the mask goes perfect with his current set of armor as well as his dark and brooding hood, and I really think that it complements his cybernetic eyes quite well as well. He still looks extremely intimidating, of course, which is a big factor for Napoleon. We want to make sure that our enemies know that when they see Napoleon on the battlefield, they won't be going home. Now, of course, though, I didn't want to just give Napoleon a new awesome looking mask. I also wanted to make some other utility items for him as well, so I ended up building him a light jetpack. Now, this is not the best jetpack, of course, but it is going to be something of a precursor or prototype to other jetpacks that we'd like to test on Napoleon and our clones. But like I mentioned, this one kind of sucks. You only get one use out of it before you have to try and uh, refuel it or recharge it. But I mean, it may get him out of a sticky situation. Who knows? Now that that's taken care of, though, it would appear that Private Ox has figured out the teleportation machine. He's managed to hack in and he believes that he's found the coordinates as to where Crimson was sent. However, since we don't know what awaits us on the other side of that portal, we've decided to not go in guns blazing with a massive army, especially since we still need to try and defend our planet and our base here. We've decided to take a stealthy approach. Private Oxford here has decided to volunteer himself to go through the portal and try to locate Crimson and bring him home. Since we're going in stealthy, he's decided to not take a blaster because of the heat signature as well as the noise, of course, that they would make, and he's decided to take a heavy magnum, also quite loud though, and a UNS see combat knife weapons that he's very familiar with but with that we bid you farewell godspeed private ox godspeed Well, I'll be the first to say that our situation here is pretty shitty, but it could be worse. We could be like this poor bastard, I suppose. A mildewy corpse lying out in the cold rain, missing his head with chunks taken out of his flesh next to what can only be described as a dead puma. Yes, no doubt his end was very gruesome and rather disgusting. Here's hoping we don't meet one just the same. I've searched the majority of this city and there's no sign of Crimson anywhere. For those of you just tuning in, Crimson is a companion of ours and this video is actually part of a much bigger expanded universe. But of course, if you don't care, that's cool too. Now, let's see, do we go to the right or to the left? I suppose let's take a look to the right. Yeah, that doesn't look too promising. Uh, very well then, maybe let's take a gander here to the left and see if our chances are better that way. No, there appears to be a smorgasbord of those undead humanoid creatures, whatever they are. I'm going to say that we're not going to go left or right. Maybe we just keep going forward. This city is absolutely massive though. Crimson could be in any number of these buildings. I'm going to have to do my best to try and check every single one as best that I can, but I continue running into these zombies and they're causing me a few issues. Like trying to bite me every damn time I go into this building. Looks like I'm going to have to let my magnum do the talking for me here. And based on my observations of this entire city and this world in general, I think my Magnum's going to have to do a lot of talking. These two silly willy little bastards chased me around for a good while until I finally put a stop to them with a bullet in the old noggin. I would continue looking around until I finally found a small little building with a bed in it and decided to give Private Ox a rest. I do want to mention that the mods I'm using for his pistol and whatnot are a little bit outdated so there's no sound or anything with them. I'm going to try to fix that before next episode, but I just thought I'd mention it. Now we did quite a bit of searching and traveling all throughout the city looking for Crimson, but there was no sign of him. The only thing that I found was a rotted duck on the ground. 
What does that have to do with Crimson? Nothing, but I found it. But of course, before we left, I decided that I would give it the good old college try once more, and I didn't find anything. No trace of Crimson, nothing. So I decided to go ahead and go to another nearby city. These poor fools weren't faring much better with the zombie crisis. The empire of this planet seems a bit backwater with some pretty weak armor, so they were struggling against the uprising as well as the rebellions that had formed, yada yada. Anyways, we're looking for Crimson. Something we weren't looking for though, however, was Trouble, but Trouble found us in the form of a waster pirate with a sniper rifle named Scrap. We ended up getting into a little bit of a teeny tiny gunfight with the little scallywag, and he ended up landing quite the shot on Ox. Ox's visor was completely shattered from the high-powered rifle, but he would continue the fight and eventually he would end up taking this waster pirate down. But now without our helmet, we are going to be much, much more vulnerable to attacks from zombies as well as any raiders or rebels. And speaking of which, we have both of those things nearby us right now and we're going to need to try to get away as best we can before they get a hold of us. Or before we end up encountering another pirate with a rifle and we don't have a visor to stop the bullet this time. We could see a small granite building from the street and we immediately rushed in to try and get to safety, but there was someone inside. He was a handsome gentleman in a suit by the name of Willis. He appeared to be quite injured and he began begging us for help. He said that he was stabbed and left for dead by a waster pirate, but managed to stuff his wounds with pieces of his beautiful suit and he somehow survived. We told him that he could tag along with us for safety's sake, but we are looking for a colleague of ours and once we found him, we'd have to be on our way. He of course accepted our gracious offer and then there were two. But of course, the first thing that we're going to do with our new friend here is take him and ourselves and get the hell out of the city as it's falling apart and littered with pirates. As well as the undead, of course. Once we were finally able to leave this horrific looking city, we would then go on to another horrific seeming city to try and continue our search for Crimson, all while battling off the undead and any pirates or anyone that we encounter. Our safest bet as we saw it was to stop by one of the Imperial cities as they are the planetary government, thus this is probably going to be the safest city. Safety aside though, even if there's no zombies or pirates here, we are beginning to starve. We are extremely hungry and we don't have anything to trade such as silver or any items. Well, we don't have any items to trade that we can afford to trade for food, unfortunately, like our magnum or armor. But of course, we would have to figure out something, as if not, we were going to starve to death. I started pondering on the idea of possibly just stealing from this settlement. But before I even had time to think about doing so, we had a massive amount of zombies crawling out of the ground and they began attacking all the townsfolk. Now, of course, the threat of this massive zombie horde coming up out of the ground was very immense, but not only was it a massive zombie horde, it was a massive zombie horde wearing space marine armor like Crimson's. It's quite the mystery that we'll have to get to the bottom of, but that'll be at a later time because right now our bullets are bouncing off their armor. I managed to find shelter for Ox and Willis, thankfully before any of the zombies could get to them, but unfortunately the two of them are separated. The only bright side to that though is both buildings that the two of them are hiding in managed to have some food. Willis began eating some pemmican and Ox ended up eating some chocolate. So in the end, our backup plan of stealing food from these settlers ended up having to be enacted because, well, we were starving and there was food. But now that we've got them both to safety and we've also got their bellies full and they're not starving to death, we need to figure out how to reunite them and get them together. Because, of course, prefer now that this city is extremely unsafe, we don't want to stick around here too much longer than we already have, and as we continue stealing things, they are going to become hostile towards us. And of course, since Ox is in a room full of items that's going to make our survival much easier, we are going to have to keep stealing, regardless of how much they end up hating us. Now, I'm not going to lie though, doing all this stealing, like I mentioned, did make them hostile towards us, but I didn't realize how big of a pain in the ass that was going to be. Because you see, now of course that they're hostile, they're just as bad as the damn pirates. In some cases, as we're trying to get around them and whatnot, they're not even focused on the zombies, they're just trying to kill us, even though the zombies, in my opinion, would be a much bigger threat. Speaking of which, as I sent Ox over to Willis, we had many close calls and many scares with said zombies as well. Thank God though, Private Ox is quite the nimble navigator and he dodged most of the attacks. When he did get hit, luckily he did not get infected by a zombie bite. After some time, we finally made it to Willis. We tried to begin healing him, but the Imperials were chasing us down, so we had to carry him to another building to try and get away from them as they were firing at us. And it was at this point we were able to finally begin healing Willis. The reason he needed healing is because some of the Imperials beat the shit out of him before we got there, yeah. 
that's my fault. But anyways, a lot of you are probably asking how Private Ox is healed already as Willis is still taking forever. Well, Private Ox still has his Void Bionics, as well as Serums, and this is giving him a greater healing factor. Regardless of healing factor, though, it does them no good if they don't get any rest, so since it seems safe for the moment, the two of them went to sleep. And after a very quick catnap, I awoke Private Ox so he could drop off the armor and other things that we collected from our building to give to Willis so he could try to defend himself as well as just both of us, really. However, while we were doing this, Imperial reinforcements showed up in the form of a raiding party and immediately began coming into the building and we had to try to run away as fast as we could, continue firing at them. Willis got knocked down. It was a whole shit show. We had Private Ox run outside of the building and then wait as we saw the Imperials leave. We rushed him back in to grab Willis and then we ran for the world border. That way we could reform a caravan. Whew, and for the moment, thank God that seemed to have worked and has saved us. So now I've decided that I am actually going to set up a very small settlement, a temporary camp, if you will, to try and get Willis healed and just try to get our shit going, man. I I'm, I'm flopping out here. We're going to get Private Ox to cut down some trees for wood to build a campfire. You know how a camp goes. You already know this stuff. Let me just say I'm having a lot of fun doing this, and I hope you guys are enjoying it as well. But this is, this is pretty intense. Uh, you know, we have to find Crimson of course, but uh, the having to survive in general is is quite difficult, I find. But I am I am loving it, and I suppose this is as good a time as any to explain to you that the difficulty settings in the Zombie Land mod I have them cranked as high as they'll go. So this is why things are extremely difficult, and this is also why I kind of feel that it's justified to use Private Ox, even though he has his bionics and serums. Now then, though, as the moon came out and the sun set, things were dark. We had a zombie creep up on us in the camp, and I actually wasn't paying attention and Willis or Ox1 managed to kill it, which was pretty cool. Of course though, this did freak me out a little bit though because my lack of attention almost got us killed or very well could have. After re-watching the footage, I realized that Ox was obviously the one to kill the zombies since Willis doesn't have any weapons anymore and he left them back at the city, so we made him a short bow and then we began collecting some steel from a nearby mountain so that we could actually make him a steel knife as a sidearm to protect himself. Not only against zombies and enemies out here in the wilderness, but because we are actually going back to the Imperial City. I mean, they have all kinds of amazing loot, and we still need to look for Crimson there. Even if he's not there, a lot of the items there could help us in our search. After returning though and beginning to look around, I realized that this might have been a slight mistake. Maybe we should have gotten items before coming back here, because this place is still a complete shit show, and many of the Imperials that were alive are now also zombies. We made a direct beeline for the most secure building that we could spot, but unfortunately we were being shot at as we were trying to enter. Looks like one of the Imperials has spotted us. As the big SOB came through the door, Ox was waiting just next to it with his knife and began engaging in melee combat with him. Unfortunately, this guy had some cataphract armor on, so this was going to take a while. But I had Willis run and grab a plasteel spear that was on the ground and began helping us melee attack him and just basically put a few dents in that big ass pure white armor. And after a while of beating the absolute shit out of him, this seemed to have worked. We have finally managed to kill one singular Imperial soldier. We then quickly began going throughout the building. Unfortunately, we very quickly encountered some more zombies and we had to run back to the room that we came from. However, after doing so, I realized that we put ourselves in a corner. Those zombies that came out of that room are just in the next room and the only other way out is to go outside where it appears there are a lot more zombies and or Imperial soldiers waiting on us. Using my mouse, I could see that the zombies were all surrounding the exit, and it looks like they're beginning to bang on the steel walls, deteriorating them. We're gonna need to find a way out before it's too late. How is it hanging? Welcome back, it is I, the Rat Daddy. As you can see, my friends, I am bringing you yet another episode of the RimWorld Zombie Land series, where the empire of this planet is trying ever so hard, yet pathetically failing to protect yet another of their cities against this impending zombie invasion. But as I sit here and mock the futile attempts of this empire to stop the zombies, I must say that we're not exactly in a good place ourselves. 
We begin with our heroes today where we last left them, completely surrounded by zombies in this building. Essentially, the two of them are bedded down for the moment, trying to brainstorm ideas on how to get out of this situation. For you see, if too many of these zombies pile up in the same place, they will begin to come over the walls, so we're running out of time. Since our only two exits were already blocked off by zombies, we had the idea that maybe we try to create our very own exit, so I had Willis and Ox begin melee attacking a wall until it collapsed. And thank God, this room was not yet filled with zombies. We would quickly enter the room and then began trying to think of more ideas because this room basically led nowhere. But I said to myself, the old tried and true break down the wall method seemed to work thus far, so let's continue with that. We got into a much bigger room where we would then try to start healing Willis, that way he would at least not be so slow when we inevitably have to leave this building. And speaking of which, that is immediately what we did shortly thereafter, but we only made it a few feet to another small building because there were zombies zombies literally everywhere. And of course, with them being everywhere, that also means that they're surrounding this small building as well, and we were so scared that we slept right on top of each other. A little odd, but okay. All throughout the night, we could hear the burning zombies just outside, extinguished by the rain occasionally, but groaning and mumbling and beating on our walls. I didn't let the two of them sleep for too long, though, as they had to get up and eat a few berries and some chocolate. I will say, with my own personal experience of using the Zombie Land mod, I really like the micromanaging factor of letting people nap for a while before they have to run away. It's really interesting. After resting for a while, though, Willis was still injured, so Ox would be the one that would go use his knife and tear down another of these walls and go out looking for crimson or any supplies or anything that we could use, of course. Now, I realize tearing down this wall seems foolish as there is a door, but the zombies were all piled around the door, so this was kind of my only option to get out there without getting injured right away. So after we quickly tore down the wall, we made a beeline for another building that we thought may have supplies, and it did, but it also had zombies, which kind of screwed us over so we had to run next to some solar panels we found some supplies and started picking those up thankfully this included a few simple meals an energy rifle for willis as well as a few brewskis but we were immediately chased away by the zombies we tried to run into a nearby building but there were zombies below us and inside the building so we were kind of screwed we tried to run around the building as best we could to get away from them and we just basically started making our way through the city trying to avoid zombies as often as possible so that we don't die and I I swear if Ox wasn't so fast and nimble on his feet, this would have never been possible. But we finally made it back to Willis and started dropping off all the supplies that we had found. And though we were excited about the meals and the energy rifle, probably the one thing we were the most excited about was cracking open a few beers with each other. No, but in all honesty, those beers are going to provide our two heroes here with a little bit of serotonin, which hopefully will keep them from having mental breaks as they're going to have to be locked in this room for a good bit longer since we're surrounded by zombies once again. And although we didn't get to search the majority of the city for crimps and we decided that it was time for us to leave. These zombies are basically all piled around our building and if we didn't leave now, eventually they would come over and kill us. Thank God though we did finally make it out alive even though Willis there at the end was starting to straggle behind a little bit. But it was time for us to move on to another city. Hopefully one that is not just so chaotic with zombies and enemies and whatnot. Maybe we'll have better chances searching there. I only hope that Crimson is okay wherever he is. <laughs> I'm sure he's probably fine. He's a big space marine guy. He can handle himself quite well. We've seen him in combat several times. Now, as we were traveling to another of these nearby cities, we actually received a notification about an ancient complex nearby. And since we didn't like being out in the open so much and we were looking for a friend of ours, we decided to go and investigate this ancient complex to see what it held within. We immediately shifted focus and started heading that way. Shortly after arriving, it was quite dark and we thought maybe we should go inside and maybe try to make camp after checking out every room and ensuring that there's no zombies or enemies within, of course. However, what we ended up finding within was very interesting. We ended up finding several ancient crates and whatnot, as well as cryo-sleep caskets. So instead of making camp right away, we decided to fiddle around with some of these things. At one point, we ended up blowing up an ancient fuel rod that exploded, and it was a whole ordeal. But an even worse ordeal was after Ox decided to try and check one of these ancient crates for any useful 
useful resources, apparently it woke up all the ancients that were sleeping. Thankfully, Willis was good at getting the hell out of the room before they could kill him, and Private Ox was good at stabbing them until they eventually died. Now that's what I call teamwork. After re-entering the front largest room of the complex, though, we found one of the gentlemen that were sleeping in the cryo sleep caskets who were actually friendly with us. Apparently this gentleman was a deserter from the Imperial Army of this planet, and he just absolutely hated their guts. He climbed into the cryo sleep casket after being injured in a gunfight with some bandits. According to Willis, the deserters haven't had a civil war with the Empire in hundreds of years, so this fellow's been in there for quite a while. We began healing him up, and then we began building a campfire so we could all get nice and toasty warm tonight. Since our new pal Juke here is very injured, Willis would begin healing himself as Ox took guard duty for the time being, and then they would both share the duty after that. However, unfortunately, they are both quite literally starving, and we have run out of food that we brought with us from the city, and it's very dangerous to go outside at this time of night. So to ensure our safety as well as our new very injured compadre, we decided to not go out looking for food in case there were zombies or enemies, and we decided to eat corpses. Yeah. It was better than starving, though, I swear. As horrific and terrible as that decision was, though, with our bellies full now, we were finally able to sleep next to our campfire. And it turns out that we had made the correct decision by eating those ancient corpses because there were a lot of zombies just outside our doors. We definitely would have been bit. The only problem is now they're inside here as well and we're trying to fight them, which honestly went quite well. And after killing the ones on the inside of our base, we decided to go outside to try and clear out any remaining that may be trying to gather up around our walls or anything like that. And there was a holy shit ton of them. By this point, the zombies on the map were getting over the 300 or so mark and by the end of this they would almost get up to about the 500 mark so we were kind of screwed and we decided to try and hide inside as uh, we came up with more plans I suppose. Unfortunately though during the skirmish with the zombies it would appear that Willis was bitten and his status of becoming a zombie because of a bite is currently unknown. But of course that's something that we'll have to deal with at a later time there are more urgent matters. Right now we decide that we need the equipment and the only people with equipment in here were us and these ancients so we opened up another cryo sleep casket killed the ancient and then took their gear. It was kind of shitty though because the only thing this ancient had on was a flak vest which for Willis I suppose is better than nothing and Juke would take the assault rifle. Unfortunately though another night inside the ancient complex also meant another night without any proper food so we ended up having to eat more of the corpses. As Ox pondered the situation he began to wonder who was more of the undead us or them. However at one point during the night I had to wake everyone up and move them to the much larger room because I had a creeping suspicion the amount of zombies just outside our walls was going to be enough to throw some over in and I ended up being correct and I'm very glad I did this. I would let our three gentlemen here finish out their sleep in this large room where it seems safe for the moment but of course this was not going to last. The zombies are just going to keep piling up against the walls and it's going to happen again. So once again it was time for us to move on. There was no sign of crimson here or really any useful resources but at least we found our new comrade in Juke. So it's time for us to go to our next city. As we were trying to leave the map, there was a large horde, a very, very large horde of zombies chasing us down, and I kind of forgot that I don't have to take them to the map's edge because this is an ancient complex. I could just do it from the world map, but it was still a daring escape nonetheless. And just like that, thankfully, we had made it out alive. Once again, we keep on having to leave these places. I'm really wanting to try to set up some type of a permanent base or something like that. Nothing uh, completely permanent, of course, but just some type of uh, operating base where we can then travel to cities after we've went home and rested. But the zombies make it extremely complicated to try and do something like that or to also try and set up a base within a city.
Hello one and all and welcome back to our RimWorld Zombie Land series where our three heroes are still currently traveling to a new city. In doing so of course they are traversing some of the toughest terrains possible but as we know there's nothing tougher than when we actually enter these cities which are normally stuffed to the brim with zombies. However with that being said as we approach the gates of this outlander city we didn't encounter a single undead. As we approach the guard post of the city the guard began explaining that they've yet to really see any massive hordes of zombies zombies because those zombies seem to be following a strange path uh, to the south and then to the west, which is odd because that's the exact path that we've been taking. Hmm. I'm sure it's just a coincidence. Anyhow though, we didn't have enough time to think about that as we actually had zombies beginning to rise out of the ground as we were just bragging on how there were none. We tried to save the guard but unfortunately she was quickly overwhelmed by a small horde of zombies and other men came to her aid but she ended up dying as they told us to flee back to a nearby camp. Said camp was full of civilians and was fairly defended. We decided to head there where we could try and help protect them but also kind of take a load off and let the outlanders defend their own city. It was a bit difficult to find because there was basically a maze of alleys and buildings, which honestly is a good thing. Maybe the zombies would have a harder time finding it. There were also plenty of double walls and whatnot, making it harder for them to climb over. After entering the camp, we gathered around the campfire with some civilians and began offering our services to anyone in need, but shockingly, everyone here seemed to be fine for the most part. And honestly, thanks to all their turrets around the camp and throughout the city, as well as these double walls that appear to be extremely important in this mob, I think that they're going to stay fine. And although it was a bit jarring, a bit odd for us to not have to be fighting constantly or trying to provide some type of medical aid and things like that to civilians or just running in general, um, I decided to just let our pawns kind of live in the moment for a minute, sit around by the campfire, stare at the clouds, just get some recreation in for a while. And finally, for the first time throughout this entire series, we had finally found something of a safe haven. We could finally let our guard down for a short period of time. But of course, as you could imagine, the feelings of safety and security would be very short-lived. As day turned to night, we realized that the camp was actually running low on rations. Everyone was becoming quite hungry and starvation was becoming quite the concern as well. Now, of course, Private Ox being the fastest soldier that we have, he was the one who was chosen to go out and look for some food. Ah yes, Ox traveling through yet another dark and dreary night, something I believe he's beginning to really thrive in. Let's see, where to go? I think we should send him to the left. Wait a minute, what is that? Oh my god. It's Crimson, but he doesn't look too happy to see us. By this point, Private Ox has been gone for hours. Juke and Willis began to worry about him. They became quite anxious, so Juke would go out looking for him as Willis stayed with the civilians. Juke found him lying there in the street in a pool of his own blood as undead began to surround him. Thankfully, it looks like we got here just in time before they could begin feasting on him. It looks like his armor's been broken by something, so it wouldn't be hard for them to do. As Juke had Ox scooped up in between his arms, he began making his way back towards the camp where everyone should be safe and sound. However, that that was not exactly the case. We could hear gunfire in the distance, and as we approached the camp, we saw Willis along with one of the outlanders firing upon an entire horde of zombies. It would appear some straggler got through and infected everyone. We of course immediately began to flee with Ox in our arms, trying to get away from these disgusting undead. As we were attempting to flee, we couldn't help but think that this may have been our fault. Have we let our guard down too soon? Regardless though, of course, for who was to blame for letting a zombie get through? All those people were already gone, and we are in this situation now. As bad as I hate to steal from the Outlanders, desperate times call for desperate measures. We began picking up weapons, clothing, and anything else that we could find that would be of use to us. And just like that, the brief period of safety and security we got to experience was over. It was us against the world once again. A world full of terrors. Luckily for us, and unfortunately for the undead lurking in the shadows outside, it would appear that Private Ox has finally healed from his injuries. Oh, that 
that void technology sure is miraculous. We immediately rushed outside of the building into the cool summer night air, where the undead immediately noticed us, of course, and we began trying to get away from them. In doing so, we actually began collecting some weapons and whatnot that we found on the ground as well before they got a little too close and we decided to get the hell out of Dodge. And thankfully, we all three had managed to make it out of the city unscathed for the most part. Now, with that being said, though, I do want to mention that that's all well and good. We made it out of the city. Nobody died. We did find Crimson, although it would appear that he's completely turned on us and is wanting to kill us. And he most likely has something to do with these zombies wearing the Space Marine armor, but also we don't have anywhere to go. However, you guys have been telling me in the comments section that double walls and caves and things like that are really good in the Zombie Land mod, so I decided to go to a very hilly area and just kind of settle down for the moment with a temporary base. And honestly, although things were very dark and brooding, even here and there were some undead in the corners of the map and whatnot, we were happy to just finally be out of that damn city eating some berries and whatnot. And you better bet your ass that we ate all the berries that we could scoop up in our little hands. Well, everyone except for Willis, he shot this turtle to death and then he ended up eating its corpse raw. He's becoming quite the survivalist. After we all got our bellies full though, we began entering this very narrow and jagged cave looking for a nice place to settle down for the night where we could try and sleep at least a little bit and we wouldn't get eaten to death by zombies, preferably. Which, because of the Fog of War mod, was actually a bit harder than it sounds because it's hard for us to see what's actually lurking in every crevice of the cave. The very next day though, everyone began collecting some resources, most importantly of which was actually plenty of wood from the trees in the nearby area. I was going to use these to build some double walls and double doors to ensure that the undead are not just coming in and out of the cave whenever they want. Because, of course, if they can come in and out of the cave anytime they want, that means they can also just kill us anytime they want. Which, once again, not preferable. In the meantime, though, it's time for us to get some proper meals set up, and we were going to do a bit of hunting. There were a bunch of zombies lurking in the area, but luckily they weren't alerted to us right away. And of course, Juke, using his superior assault rifle, managed to kill an Ibex ram, which was perfect for dinner tonight. He would take it all the way back to base, where Ox would cut it up and turn it into some meals for everyone. But we don't want to get that dastardly mood debuff of eating without a table, so we used plenty of the wood that we had to actually make some stools and a table for everyone. And I do just want to take a moment and say that, you know, I've really enjoyed trying to survive in the cities, even though it's never really panned out for us, most likely because the difficulty is set so high for Zombieland. If we set it lower, I think we could definitely um, try to live within the cities without any real issues, but I don't know, that wouldn't seem as fair to me, especially since Ox has all of his um, bionics and serums and whatnot, and Juke has some pretty badass armor and whatnot as well, right? So, uh, but I've enjoyed trying to survive in the city, but this base building really takes me back to the roots of RimWorld and, you know, just starting a new colony, so it's really nice. And something also that is really nice is that we finally have three colonists, three survivors in this massive zombie land, this infected planet, right? It's not just Ox anymore, and it's not just Ox and Willis who keeps getting injured and is always trying to heal. <laughs> he, he finally has time to heal because now we have uh, two other options for our colonists if we need something done. Welcome back to the RimWorld Clone Army series, where Wood Ward and Napoleon have been standing by this machine for a good long while and uh, Ox hasn't come back yet. So, I guess we're gonna do something else. Unfortunately, I'm afraid we can't sit around and wait on Ox to find Crimson and for the two of them to come back through the teleportation machine forever, so we're going to have to let life go on and continue our progress and hope that they're not dead. Mostly because if they are dead, then I don't know who's going to do all the shit that they had to do before, like carrying stone chunks and whatnot, so they better hope they're not dead. Speaking of the grandiose amounts of work that we're going to begin performing around the base, one of the first things that we're doing is actually building a large walkway around the landing pad for our brand new Hammerhead class cruiser. Which, okay, yeah, you caught me. We still don't have near enough resources to build the cruiser, but when we do get those resources, we need somewhere good to park it, of course, and we don't just want somewhere to park it, we want it to look good as well. That and the fact, of course, we need a clear runway so we're not landing on trees and chunks and stuff like that, of course. Now, part of that, of course, means that it's going to need a lot of stone and uh, that's something 
something that we really don't have a lot of, surprisingly. Now, we could go out and buy that, but I see no reason to when we have so many stone chunks lying around. So we built a bunch of stone cutting tables, just straight up manual stone cutting tables. I do know that I could try and download one of the mods that have electric stone cutting tables to make this process go a lot faster, and I might end up doing that at some point, but I was a bit lazy in this episode. Regardless, though, we have plenty of manpower, and our clones went day and night cutting through all of these slate blocks. That way we can try and make more slate flagstone to attach to the current landing strip made of that and yada yada. You get the point. We're just making a big old landing strip. Now of course this new landing area is very large and it's going to take a very long time and things were going extremely slowly. I never really show you guys too often but normally in this save for the clone army things are like extremely slow. Luckily though during this time I ended up getting a new motherboard and a new CPU so after I got that installed it everything went hunky dory. Things were running much, much smoother, and I was so tickled to see it. But truthfully, with this episode, I wanted to do things a little bit differently. I think we have just enough spare droids lying around that aren't too damaged to perform this. And finally, just like that, after hours of work, Napoleon has finally created our very own battle droid. It is a coagulation of our remaining tissue cells we still had left over, our droid parts that were not too damaged, as well as void technology and bionics. Now, with that being said, though, it does have a name. It goes by the name CCDW, which, of course, stands for Cybernetic Clone Droid Warrior. Really rolls off the tongue, doesn't it? Napoleon Napoleon, of course, wasted no time, though, building his new beautiful creation some armor to go along with it to ensure that his internal robotics and whatnot are protected. Now, of course, given the fact that we ended up using our remaining tissue samples we had left over for the Omega clone squad that we created, he basically has the exact same skill set and whatnot as our regular clones, except he's not made of flesh, he's made of metal. Well, maybe a little flesh. Regardless, though, he looks totally badass, and since he is a total badass, Badass, we want to prove that. We're actually going to send him out on his very own mission. As you can see, not too far from the base, the Imperials are actually sieging the last remaining Itakin settlement here on the planet. And unfortunately, it would appear that the Itakins are putting up one hell of a fight, and the Imperials are struggling just a teeny tiny bit, so we're sending a helping hand. Not only do we want to provide a helping hand because the Empire is under our control, but this Itakin settlement will play a crucial part in our remaining control over the entire planet. CC ended up landing not too far away from the Imperial Siege, just on the outskirts of the Itakin settlement, and began preparing to engage them in combat. It was finally time that we saw what our little droid project could do. And I don't mean to spoil anything for you, but he did not let us down at all. He would begin engaging these furry man beast in melee combat as they got too close, and at one point, I was a little nervous because they had him completely surrounded on all sides, but he managed to cut tear and just dig his way out with his sword. He then immediately began tanking the damage from several volleys of grenades all at once and continued the battle. At one point, the Itakin were finally fleeing their last remaining home on the planet, but CC didn't let them get away that easy. He began chasing them down as they were fleeing and firing upon them. And with this settlement taken, this battle finally won as the rain falls upon our blood-soaked hands. And with that, Napoleon's fingers slip closer onto the throat of this planet, giving more way to his chokehold. Not only were we victorious in this battle though, but we were also successful in testing out CC's abilities in combat. Now of course though with that being said, we don't fully control the planet just yet. Some of the populace is still a bit rebellious like the insurrectionist or even the waster pirates. But of course those few remaining factions who refuse to bend the knee to us will get what's coming to them soon enough. For now though, Napoleon actually has something of a ceremony, a celebration of the Ending of this war, our victory over the Itigans.
I must say, though, that this final battle was not only a test of our new droid, though, but it was a test of the Empire and their loyalty and their usefulness. And now that they've proven themselves, I'd like to introduce to you the new planetary defenders, the Imperials. Others have stood in the way of clone progress, but not the Empire. They now stand behind us. Of course, not all of the shattered Empire remnants are the same, and they are just as they seem, shattered. But the Empire of this planet is now one in the the same with the clones. And I suppose it's just as the old saying goes, if you can't beat them, absorb them, and turn them into your tyrannical government of your planet, or you know, something like that, however it goes. And also, we obviously definitely could have beaten them. But I suppose now that the largest pirate faction on the planet's been completely wiped out, and the Empire is under our total control after proving themselves worthy, we'll need to start planning out other wars, start building on the base more and more. Uh, there's always more and more work to be completed here at the base. As you can see, the massive landing pad that we've been working on, I mean, an entire war has ended, and we've still, unfortunately, only gotten a fraction of it done, but I'm sure it'll come with time. We need to start working on our people, our armor, and whatnot as well, so something we ended up working on at this point was some new jumpsuits for everyone. Well, actually, now that I think about it, I believe they're called body gloves, but as you can see, most of our people here have tattered apparel, and for the majority of our soldiers, that is their body gloves. So we immediately had Ward Ward and Napoleon begin working on a shit ton of those for all of our soldiers. Now, I know that this might seem kind of like a frivolous thing to be working on, and Rat Knight, why are you worried about it? The clone army's super badass, but I will say that the body gloves are actually a pretty crucial part of our armor. Because honestly, at the end of the day, when our armor bursts open like a pineapple or some shit like that, the body glove is the only thing left protecting them from getting their green skin peppered with bullets and blaster fire. So, you know, I guess you could say the body gloves were kind of important for the most part. But as Napoleon and Wart Wart work on a bunch of body gloves, I think we should also begin working on some new research. It's been quite a while since we began researching anything, and I thought the perfect thing to research would actually be circuit breakers. Now, circuit breakers are going to help us ensure that our power grid is not easily compromised. It's not all that often that we have a zzz event where we lose all of our power, but it is definitely possible. And since we're going to be taking to the stars pretty soon, any clones that are left behind in the base are going to be relying heavily on our defenses that are also going to be relying on our power grid. Now look, speaking of which, I love our base, you love our base, we all love our base. It is wonderful, but I kind of had an idea and I wanted everyone's feedback on it. I was thinking, since we are basically the head of the imperial government here on the planet and we are the massive powerhouse of the planet and whatnot, we should really have a capital city, so I thought maybe we would find a new patch of land somewhere and use a bunch of resources to build a massive city for us. Originally, I was thinking that the massive hammerhead cruiser would kind of be our end goal for season two here, but now I'm kind of thinking that that's just a milestone along the way and maybe a massive capital city would actually be our end goal. Of course, we're going to need plenty of materials and with a hammerhead cruiser, we could actually go to other worlds, destroy other factions to get those materials, such as the Federation for their faux rum for our walls and whatnot, or even void ones. More. But let me know what you guys think in the comment section down below. I love you ever so much, and I will see you next time. Crimson's Log, Jugust 8. My continuous experimentation with the warp has proven to be less than fruitful. It would appear that no matter how hard I call upon the powers of Nurgle, the Plague Lord, Chaos God of Disease, Decay, and Death, my calls seem to go unanswered. Ugh, yet another mistake to unleash upon this planet. I do often wonder, though, if I were to have the right host, perhaps, this may go quite differently. Said host will almost definitely not come willingly, but that shouldn't be an issue.
Hello one and all and welcome back to the RimWorld Zombie Land series where at the moment things are a teeny tiny bit sticky, yeah just a little bit messy as we're all hiding out in our cave here. Naturally of course that's not going to keep us from eating our breakfast or getting the rest of our sleep out. And trust me when I say that we're going to need to get as much sleep as possible because we're going to have a very long day. Starting off we have quite the issue. We have a lot of zombies getting very close to our walls and of course uh, for obvious reasons this is not good so we're going to use the limited resources that we have here in the cave to build a wall in front of the door to prevent any zombies from just waltzing on in if they cross over the first door. The second and much larger issue that we had is now that we've covered all our exits and entrances we don't have any way off the map so we're going to need to dig a very long tunnel all the way through this mountain to the end of the map. And now look by far this is not the most practical solution but it is most definitely the safest solution that we have available to us. So Juke will continue mining with his big strong muscles while Private Ox and Willis begin working on our bedroom and other portions of the cave just to make it a little bit more suitable. The prettier the cave is, the less likely the chance that one of these three will have a mental break. Which honestly isn't too big of a deal with them going into a daze and wandering outside now that we have all the entrances blocked, but it is kind of a big deal if they were to go berserk or into an insulting spree. However, with that being said, after they got their little nappy nap out, the very next day we would immediately begin mining more of the mountain. I know what you're asking yourself, why are you so concerned with leaving the map? Well, the reason for that, my friends, is because we're going to send Ox out on a mission to collect resources. Resources that we hope will be able to create a powerful enough generator to power a comms console just enough to get a signal out for help. Now, of course, we do have plenty of steel and components here under the mountain, but we're also going to need some technology to try and modify the signal and amplify it since we're under the mountain, yada yada, a bunch of tech technical jargon, the deal is we gotta go out, okay? And of course, with Ox being our fastest and strongest member, he volunteered himself. Now, with that being said, we are just about ready to send him out as we have this very long hallway in the cave complete. I would be lying, though, if I said that I wasn't extremely nervous about sending Ox out all by himself, because without Juke or Willis there, if he were to go down, it's over with for him. Of course, though, he was the best candidate to go out on a solo mission, and having more than one person very well may slow us down. Down. Now that's not to say that Willis and Juke were going to be useless back at the cave. No, they were actually very crucial to keeping the cave secure. See, like I mentioned earlier, there's a shit ton of zombies forming just outside our walls, kind of coagulating together in these large hordes, and that's really scary because they could come over the walls. So we had Willis and Juke use the steel from the cave to begin building more walls. Yes, of course, this plan only works if Ox manages to go to this city and make it out alive with the appropriate resources, but it also only works if when he returns back to the cave, he's not facing down a mindless horde of the undead that have overtaken Willis and Juke. But once again, of course, that is if he survives this city all by himself. We arrived not too far outside the city limits and immediately began entering buildings looking for resources that we could use. To begin with, we found a shit ton of recreation and luxury items, a lot of bionics and body parts and things like that, and a holy shit ton of weapons as well. None of those were too interesting until we found a plasma sword. Which honestly would be a good replacement for our UNSC combat knife we lost when Crimson stopped us in the last week. Something else that we found that was very interesting was a vitals monitor. With Ox's expertise, he very well may be able to hack into this and use it to amplify the signal of a comms console. However, looks like we're going to have to come back for that in just a moment because one of the townsfolk is kind of pissed off at us and wanted to get into a little stabbing match, which we ultimately would win. We would then continue looking all throughout this building for any other resources that we could use. We ended up finding some zombies and that was about it. They weren't very useful resources though. What we're really looking for is chem fuel for a generator. We specifically need a chem fuel generator because chem fuel is a more efficient fuel thus we will receive a more efficient signal to send out. We're also going to take this monitor with us. Yoink. Then it's time for us to move on in the name and in the search of some yummy tasty burnable chem fuel. Which was actually a lot harder to find than I had anticipated throughout the city. It is very possible that the citizens and guards and soldiers and whatnot used up the remaining chem fuel to power their turrets and whatnot, but I do see a lot of lights on in some of these buildings, so I'm going to doubt that's the case. But unfortunately, yet again, we are being attacked by yet another civilian or soldier or something. Anyhow, we're going to stab them to death. 
there we are. Eventually though, after searching all throughout the night, I finally found a wooden shack here with chem fuel in it. The only problem, it was stuffed to the brim with zombies. So I immediately took our Malta gun and started flambasting one of the wooden walls to destroy it, and that way the zombies would come out. We could run to the side and try to sneak in, but unfortunately this plan didn't work either. However, as we were fighting the zombies that were running out and just basically trying to keep Ox alive as best we could, we ran to the south section of the building where we would run in and there was chem fuel there with no zombies. There was quite a bit less of it here so we won't be able to run our comms console for long, but hey, it's chem fuel. We burst through another one of the walls and began trying to make our way out of this damn city. And as you could imagine, by this point during the night, the city was filled with massive hordes of the undead that were very relentless and they wouldn't stop coming, no matter how many times we shot them right in the head with our melter gun. Luckily though, thank god we finally made it out of the city alive and unharmed for the most part and began making our way back to the cave. Meanwhile, back at the cave, Juke was mining his little heart out at some compacted machinery so we could get plenty of components for our comms console as well as the generator. By this point as well, we had already mined out a shit ton of steel from the lower section of the cave, so we were finally ready to build said generator and it turned out alright. However, unfortunately though, it didn't help anything that we had to keep expending resources to build more walls as the zombies kept tearing, ripping, and shredding through the ones we currently have. Which in turn, of course, means we're going to have to continue mining steel to build more walls to keep the zombies at bay. But even after we send out our distress signal, we're going to have to keep building these walls until help arrives. So long story short, we're going to need a shit ton of steel, but it would appear that Ox has finally returned home and his mission was a success. Truthfully though, even returning back alive from a mission nowadays on this planet is a victory in its own right. Regardless though, we hooked up our vitals monitor to the generator and began working on the comms console. Once we had the comms console built, we ended up syncing it up with the vitals monitor. Don't ask me how we did it or what it does, but it should help us out with the signal of the distress call. We then fueled up the generator and we were ready to go. Well, that seems to be everything. Let's just hope that that does the trick. Oh shit, and let's hope that it does the trick fast because it looks like the zombies are bursting through our walls. We're not gonna have enough time to stop them or build anymore. We did, however, manage to make it to our rooms just before they got a hold of us. But unfortunately, they're just outside those doors. I'm not going to lie to you, I really didn't know what to do in this situation. There was no way out except through them. But unfortunately, they would burst through and we had no chance. <sighs> Well, it looks like somebody finally heard our distress call. It's not the clone army, but I suppose the UNSC will do. The only problem being, I don't think there's much left for them to save. Well, it looks like they mean business. I didn't expect our distress signal to be met with such seriousness from the UNSC of all people, but I suppose they're just happy to help us? Or I suppose it's possible that they're looking for someone, and I'm not talking about what's left of Willis lying there on the ground. No, I believe they may be looking for Private Ox. Unfortunately, however, Corporal Haley saw no sign of Ox within, and Willis is too badly injured to explain anything to us at this moment. Even so, though, it would seem that he is our our best lead at finding the private.
Ah uh, yes, welcome back once again my friends to the RimWorld Zombieland series, where not only do we have Crimson, but we also have Private Ox alongside him, and where at the moment their lord and master, the chaos god known as Nurgle, has requested a show of their devotion and power. Yes indeed, if Crimson and his comrades are going to lead Nurgle's forces into battle under his name, they're going to have to show that they're strong enough. And truly, at the moment, there is only one subject that is strong enough on this planet for Crimson and Private Ox to take on to prove their worth to Nurgle, the massive hordes of undead. Well, 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 to no one's surprise, of course, that battle seemed to go into the favor of our two protagonists, or antagonists, depending on what side you're looking at them from. And in defeating this massive army of zombies, of course, they've earned the respect of their Lord Nurgle. However, with that being said, their work here on this planet is far from done. We need a base of operations. So, of course, Crimson and Ox will travel city to city looking for a suitable place for a base that is worthy of their Lord Nurgle and themselves as well as their forces that have yet to come. A nearby pirate city seemed quite ample for this opportunity, but of course we would have to clear out the inhabitants of the city. Just as well as clearing out the occasional undead that are a bit chaotic and try to attack as though they are our master's creation and Crimson is somewhat responsible for this entire zombie plague they are still bloodthirsty agents of chaos that cannot be controlled. Regardless though, our master was always watching and we couldn't let him think that we were a bunch of sissy babies that weren't worthy of being his apprentices or slaves or whatever he turns us into, I suppose. Whatever it may be, Crimson didn't care as long as he got his revenge, his long-awaited revenge against the clones. Crimson would stop at nothing. He would conquer this city, every city on the planet. He will conquer multiple planets if that is what it takes to get his revenge. And alongside the new zombified Private Ox, he very well may fulfill his lust for vengeance. But as it currently stands, many obstacles still stand in the way, like conquering the rest of this planet, as well as the empire of this planet, who is currently here to try and stop us. Oh, those poor, dumb, foolish bastards to think that they could stop us when they couldn't even simply stop a few undead from taking over the entire planet. Our justice, however, would be swift as mountains of soldiers' bodies began piling up in the streets of this city. The shattered empire of this galaxy is indeed shattered, but the one of this planet will be decimated. And from the remnants of their soldiers, Nurgle will create something new, something beautiful. The armies of the undead shall rule this planet ten times over, and chaos shall finally reign here, just as it will throughout the entire galaxy, and eventually, the universe. Crimson has truly come a long way, from teleporting himself here using the Void technology to basically being the cause and or ground zero for the zombie outbreak on the planet, using the 
Chaos God's powers. I know a lot of you guys in the comment section have been discussing and kind of debating exactly what has caused the zombie outbreak on this planet, and of course it is due to Crimson using the warp and the powers of Nurgle that has kind of caused this massive zombie plague and things like that. And of course, the powers of the Chaos Gods and the warp and everything have also ended up turning Crimson into a filthy, disgusting heretic who has turned his back on the Imperium. All for the lust of power and vengeance. There of course are still so many unanswered questions about Crimson's motives and what he plans on doing per se though. We don't know the exact specifics of course, but something we do know is that his love for the Chaos God Nurgle has went on for a very, very long time even as far back to when he was still serving the Imperium. Behind his brother's backs, behind closed doors, he was still worshipping him. A slithering snake in the grass, waiting for his chance to strike where it hurts. And in exchange, of course, the Chaos God would provide him with the skills and power that he would need so that he could survive and win battles that others could not. During several joint operations with the UNSC at clearing out insectoid hives, as well as battling the Covenant forces, Nurgle was there. He saw all, and he protected Crimson above all other things, his brothers having no idea that a heretic stand among them. But of course, there was one thing that Nurgle did not anticipate, nor did Crimson. The Clone Army. Of course, Napoleon, Wartward, and everyone else had no idea that this filthy space marine was worshipping a chaos god right under their noses. Well, I mean, of course, the space marines didn't even know this, so how could we? But, I digress. Regardless, however, Crimson has some pretty big plans, and only time will tell how all this goes. Welcome back to the RimWorld Clone Army series. My dear friends, I am so glad to have you back with me here today, where at the moment we are still working on the massive landing pad for our Hammerhead Cruiser that we've yet to build. Of course, as I've mentioned time and time again, this project is pretty enormous. For whatever reason, the clones are really struggling to get this massive landing strip going, and also the game still runs pretty slow when we're trying to build stuff like this, so on to something else. One of the first things we're doing today is planting a whole bunch of cotton in our hydroponics basins and of course the reason behind that is because we need a whole heaping shit ton of cloth for the cruiser now of course that means we're going to need plenty of cotton blah 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 you get the point i think within the next few episodes i really want to try to buckle down and finish the cruiser so throughout this episode and whatnot you're going to see me collecting a lot of resources now because we're going to be diverting all of our growing time to cotton so we can have cloth for the cruiser that does mean we need an alternate source of food. So of course, as you can imagine, I'm going to hunt all of the animals on the map, and I literally mean all of them. And I'm talking that we're going to be hunting wild horses, we're going to be hunting boomalopes, rhinoceros, we're even going to be hunting all of the mega sloths, especially the mega sloths actually, because they're massive. And we're going to need to get all that sweet, succulent, meaty substance that we can, baby. Mm -mm -mm. Would you look at that, our freezer full of the animals of our territory. Nothing more than a beautiful sight to behold, in my opinion. Even though we are the planetary army, we are truly a community here. Everyone chips in. Even our android was cooking. It was during this time as well that I realized all of our planters were out hunting, cooking, butchering, and things like that, and none of the cotton had actually been planted, so I took a handful of clones, tossed them into the hydroponics room, locked them in until all the planting was done, and there we go. We would finally have all of our hydroponics basins stuffed to the brim with cotton plants, and after some time, we will get some cloth. But unfortunately, right slap dab in the middle of that, we received a notification that Void had expanded once more upon the planet using their teleportation devices. No doubt they must have sent some remnants here or something, and they've overtaken one of the Imperial settlements. Now, the empire of this planet is slowly becoming a massive powerhouse as we grow them and nurture them just like the little babies and plants that they are to us, but they still 
need our help at this time, so we're gonna send some people over to kick Void's ass, as we always do. But, you know, guys, if I could be honest with you for just one second, I was kinda glad that we got that notification, because, you know, even though I love collecting resources and planting and hunting, nothing brings me more joy than dropping nuclear bombs on these sons of bitches. And if you've watched any of Season 1, or even a good portion of this season, you already know that I have a fusion bomb with Void scratched into the side of it waiting for them. Ah, as we hovered overhead, getting a good view of their new base that they've taken from the Empire and that they've kind of rearranged into one of their standard bases, my mouth salivated with the thoughts of dropping said bomb. I decided that we would let Cece and Taylor handle the dropping of the bomb as Taylor is very seasoned in this sort of thing and they were both kind of leading the mission, of course. And just like that, off we go. Fortunately, the nuclear bombs did not completely decimate all of the Void forces, and you did hear correctly, I said fortunately, because I've been itching for a fight. This time around though, things would be slightly different. We would not be fighting alone as the Empire had sent some support. Though of course, I would like to point out that these reinforcements were not necessary, although they were very much appreciated. A wonderful sign of the Empire's loyalty. And although the Imperials looked super badass in their brand new helmets and whatnot, that we've provided to them and they fought valiantly and very hard they for the most part ended up dying damn near immediately after fist fighting with void but that was okay as taylor and the others were still here but i suppose if nothing else they did make for a pretty good buffer between us and the void remnants that had taken over this settlement and if that's not good enough for you they at the very least drew some of the fire so in other words they were kind of cannon fodder but hey we didn't ask them to come here they sent their own men to die and as the sun was beginning to rise on yet another beautiful day here upon the planet, we had finally defeated most of the Void Remnants and began trying to execute an attack on the remainder of their base that we hadn't nuked into dust, of course killing their droids and any mutants that remain within. Which I must say was a lot easier said than done, don't get me wrong, we still managed it, but these Black Titans were a lot stronger than I remember in the last season. Unfortunately though, during the conflict, as the Imperials were taking on Void forces, our ship was destroyed, so we had to ask Wart Wart to come and pick us up. And if I can be completely honest with you, I don't even know if I want to try and build another one because I think that's the third or fourth ship that we've lost, so I, I don't know. Anyhow though, immediately after we got into the ship, we also loaded up a lot of the resources that we got from raiding this void settlement and immediately began trading with every single Outlander settlement we could before eventually having to come all the way back home, dropping off all these goods. Now during this time, we bought a teeny tiny bit of uranium, but the one resource that we bought the most off, of course, is cloth because we need a shit ton of cloth for our cruiser. As I've said time and time again, we immediately began trying to haul it all in very urgently as well. And we had also began harvesting what little bit of cloth that we had grown from our cotton field that ended up kind of getting cut in half by the giant landing pad for the cruiser, but that's okay, we'll try and grow some more. Now, I will say trying to grow the cotton for cloth is a good idea, it just takes a very long time, and honestly, we can get a lot more by just going to settlement to settlement and trying to purchase a lot of it, and we have plenty of resources to trade for the cloth, so it's not really a big deal, it's just extremely tedious, and eventually, we do have to wait for them to kind of restock before buying more. However, of course, that would be a problem for the future, Rat and I, because we are taking to the skies once again to fly settlement to settlement every other Outlander faction on the planet that we had missed the first time, or we couldn't carry it all. I forgot why I went back home that fast, but anyhow, we're trading with all the other settlements, and once that was complete, we had more cloth. And this time around, it was slightly a little bit less than the original trip that we made buying up all the cloth, but it was still a good drop in the bucket overall, I must say. Now, of course, another good portion of the cloth that we ended up having in storage came from our hydroponics basin, which took a very long time to grow, and I mean a very long time, so I just kind of sat around and waited, let the clones do whatever they wanted to, and then eventually it was fully grown, and we began harvesting it. Whew, let me just say, I don't mind doing all this because I love you guys and I love this colony and this series and this is all super fun but holy shit does it take forever to get this amount of resources to build one of these cruisers 
Now, of course, in hearing me saying that, you're probably thinking that I collected all the cloth that we need. <laughs> oh, you poor thing. No, no, we still have under half of the amount of cloth that we're going to need. But like I said, it is a huge drop in the bucket as we didn't even have a fraction of this before. Hello, one and all, and welcome back to the RimWorld Clone Army series, where today, my friends, currently, we are busy, busy little bees, as it were. We are going to be building our starship today. Come hell or high water or whatever, we are getting it done. Of course, though, it's not near as easy as just saying that. We still have plenty of resources to collect, so we're going to begin today by purchasing some cloth from a orbital trader. But of course, as you already know, this is nothing but a mere fraction, a fraction of a fraction of the amount of cloth and whatnot that we're going to need, so I have something up my sleeve. But until then, we're going to be refueling all of our ships as well as making plenty of fuel for the starship. Because I can go ahead and tell you that that hammerhead cruiser is going to have one big old heaping gas tank. And although it's going to take a very long time, I'm sure we do have plenty of wood to turn into chem fuel, so we should be good. But now you're probably asking yourself, Rat Knight, how do you plan on getting all those resources to even build the ship, though you still lack a lot of cloth? Well, my friends, we are going to begin conquering the Waster Pirate factions who actually have some massive fields of cotton. And this is going to be really fun and interesting. It's quite different for us because normally we would just bomb the shit out of a settlement and take their resources, but we can't do that here because it would burn all of the crops. So we're going to have to go in and strategically kill everyone before doing so. But if there's anything we in the clone army are, my friends, it is strategic and it is winners. I'm not really sure. But anyway, they weren't very excited to see us, so they immediately began trying to bomb us with fire and toxic gas, as one might imagine. But of course, like two heat-seeking rockets of ass-kickery, Wart Wart and CC would begin firing upon the Waster Pirates. With such aim, speed, and ferocity, you would assume that they were robots. Well, actually, technically, CC is a robot, but never mind. But as you can tell, those laser blasts were the final nail in the coffin for this settlement, and all of the Waster Pirates were beginning to run away like a bunch of pansies. Which, of course, means it's time for us to start harvesting these sweet, sweet resources. This is going to be a nice addition to the cloth that we have back home, but of course, there's still much more to do, such as raiding more and more of these Waster pirate settlements for their sweet cloth. Naturally though, first things first, we're going to run all the way back home and drop off this load because we don't want it to get burnt up by mortar fire or anything else like that at the next waster pirate settlement, so we did that and then began heading to our next target. This settlement also had a beautiful and fine bounty of resources, ripe for the picking of course. However, they also had something else, what appeared to be some type of makeshift waster pirate spartan with stolen UNSC gear, no doubt. We had little concern for these enemies, though, as we were sure that we could defeat them, but it was quite interesting to see that these Waster Pirates were somewhat moving up in the world. And these Waster Spartans actually proved to be quite formidable. They were not all that powerful for the most part, but they could take one hell of a hit. And unlike the majority of their comrades, they could sit there and take a hit while also dishing out a fairly heavy hit as well. I gotta be honest, it was pretty respectable, but in the end, we would end up killing as many as possible, except Except for one of them who ended up getting away as the majority of the waster forces began descending on us and we just started killing them and they all began to flee of course. Though unfortunately it would appear that CC and Wart Wart were a bit too concerned with the massive mob of wasters that were coming right at them that they didn't even notice the one that got away unfortunately. Hopefully we won't be seeing him anytime soon. But of course if we do, we're not scared. We're gonna kick his ass, let's be honest. Now of course, with all the enemies cleared out by one way or another, whether they fled or if they're lying on the ground dead, it was time for us to begin harvesting all their crops once again, and then we would end up loading all this cloth into our ship and heading all the way back home where we would drop it off once more. After returning home, we would take a good while to try and get everything hauled into our storage facility so that I could get a good read on how much cloth and whatnot we actually had over all for the uh, Hammerhead Cruiser, um, you know, and just to kind of sit around <laughs> and stop raiding places for a little while and actually grow our own cotton in our hydroponics basin, stuff like that. Part of the reason as to why, of course, I wanted to get rid of all the waster pirates and any other enemies on the planet, but that could be done in due time. Really, I was just trying to gauge which one was more beneficial in terms of getting resources so we can finish our cruiser today. And though growing our own cloth was very useful and whatnot, it did prove true that 
internet rating was still the better option for us, so that's exactly what we began doing once more. This time around, we would end up raiding a waster pirate settlement in the desert with a massive cotton field, so that means plenty of cloth, naturally. And of course, this time around, Napoleon decided to tag along as well, which obviously means that we are going to decimate these forces, which, I mean, we would do anyhow, but Napoleon, Wardwart, and CC, in my opinion, are our three strongest warriors for sure. And I feel like that opinion is shown here in full force as the wasters are trying to run out to even get a shot at Ward Ward, Napoleon, and CC as they are just completely annihilating them, evaporating them as they're walking out. With the majority of their compadres reduced to dust in the sand, they began to flee, of course. One poor rapscallion was caught by Napoleon, his jetpack, and his lightsaber. <laughs> you poor dumb fool, you'll never get away. And with those few last remaining enemies defeated, it was finally time for us to reap our reward. We began harvesting this beautiful crop for its beautiful cloth, and now we actually have enough cloth to build our ship. Now all we had to do though was get it hauled into our storage facilities. However, we were still missing one crucial part of this resource puzzle. Steel! Yes indeed, we were missing a whole heaping shit ton of steel, but I had an idea. We were going to kill two birds with one stone. Of course, we've been talking about building a capital city here on the planet to replace our base, and I've decided that we will choose a location that we're going to build the city at, and we're also going to mine that location for plenty of steel and whatnot as well, right? It was the best thing ever, and that's exactly what we began doing. Even though we had a pretty small squad of clones to do this, we ended up tearing down all of the steel structures in the area, as well as mining all of the steel veins that we could see, and we would begin traveling back and forth, back and forth, a lot of times, way back and forth, because steel was so heavy, of course, we had to make several trips. Eventually, though, we had brought it all back, and we finally had enough to build the ship, right? Uh, wrong, actually. I had made a massive miscalculation, for you see, I had completely misread the amount of steel that we needed. It turns out we need 111,250. Damn, I can't even read. So that means that we need exactly... Um... Uh, a lot more than we currently have. So it's time for me to really buckle down and just start mining the shit out of a bunch of different locations. I'm actually going to leave the city location alone because I don't want to completely destroy it, so we're not going to touch that one and mine all the mountains or anything there. However, we are going to do that to other locations just as well. We have a holy heaping ton of steel slag chunks all around the base that we've never even touched. So we have all of those that we're going to begin smelting down for steel as well. That's a good idea, but also we don't get a lot of steel from that, so eh, mining is still our best option. But since we've already shredded up all the droid corpses from the previous mini raids that we've had, I thought that smelting these chunks could be something useful for our clones to do in the meantime. Napoleon would also call in a massive steel drop from our empire, which was also extremely useful. And the amount of resources that the Imperials dropped off to us was a massive, massive amount. A massive help as well, but we still required much more. Yes, indeed, for this project to truly be completed, for it to really even begin, honestly, we would have to move literal mountains. And that's exactly what we set out to do for months on end. But then, finally, winter was here, and with it, our collection of resources was finally complete. It was time for us to finish our Hammerhead Cruiser once and for all. And if you can't tell by the tone in my voice and how I said that, I am extremely, extremely excited. This has taken absolutely forever. This may be one of the biggest projects I've ever completed in RimWorld. Like, definitely the biggest ship for sure, but the biggest uh, structure, building, whatever, man. It, it is huge and took forever. And as you'll notice, I didn't actually get the construction on camera. When I came back, it was finished. I would actually let the game play all by itself while the clones were just bringing resources to this, and I would sit and watch TV in my living room. I mean, it, it literally took hours. I'm not even kidding. I'm thinking next episode, we finally begin raiding some other planets, possibly, for resources and begin building our massive capital city. But let me know what you guys think about that in the comments section. I love you all ever so much, and I'll see you next time. Goodbye.
Hello one and all and welcome back to the RimWorld Clone Army series where at the moment my friends our clones as well as Napoleon are on their way to invade the Federation homeworld. I mean, let's be honest with each other, this has been a long time coming. Since the first day that we encountered the Federation, we knew we would have to destroy them and conquer them. And that day, my friends, has finally come. By the time that we're finished here, every single Federation soldier will be dead. This planet will be reduced to atoms. And although the process will most likely take a very long time, because we don't just plan on nuking every single city, no. We are going to be launching ourselves into the battle to try and save as many resources as we can, as we will be using those resources to build our capital city back home. For you see, the invasion of this pitiful Federation planet is not only for revenge, although that is a pretty good sized part of it, it is also for their precious forum. A metallic resource that is so strong, even Napoleon's lightsaber has the slightest difficulty cutting through it. Once we had finally defeated this Federation city though, we would end up breaking up all of their bots and other creations that were made from this beautiful forum material and we would begin butchering them, giving us plentiful piles of forum. Of course, naturally, this is not enough to build our city, so we're going to have to repeat this process several times, but that's okay as we have many Federation cities. Along with Forum, we would also get several, and I mean several, piles of synthetic meat. You know, previously we would always eat these from our meat bots, as we used to call them, and that's still a good idea, but I was beginning to have maybe a better idea with what to do with it. You see, I've recently been inspired by some Warhammer 40k lore that I was catching up on, and I thought maybe instead of eating this meat, we could send it back home. So from our ship hovering well above the planet, we would drop massive piles of this synthetic meat onto yet another Federation city, uh, returning their allies as it were. This served something as leaflets to let them know as to what was coming. Now this was not to give the Federation any time to evacuate or anything like that by a long shot, but more of an omen or a, you know, a sign as to what was to come. And what was to come was our clones and Napoleon firing down upon them until they were all dead. And I must say, although we have enough nuclear bombs stocked up in our starship to basically cause an apocalyptic event for the entire planet, this was so much more fun to drop down upon the ground and begin slaughtering them. God, does it feel good to be so bad. Or good, depending on your perspective. You may also notice that Napoleon's missing his mask. I don't know what happened to it when we touched ground here, but I eventually found it and put it back on him later. Anyhow, though, we are cutting up meat bots and getting all those sweet succulent reasons Sources, or at least I thought we were. Turns out the clones needed a quick power nap here on the ground. I guess all that intergalactic travel made them a teeny tiny bit weary. I suppose that's my fault for not letting them sleep before the invasion began. Well, in the meantime, while we're letting our soldiers rest, Napoleon here would go around slaughtering all of the remaining meat bots who were struggling on the ground to try and get up. Now, by this point, you may also be asking yourself, Rat Knight, where are the other clones? This is supposed to be a clone army, and you only have have like what 15 16 here well that is a good question my observant viewer I've actually ended up leaving quite a few of them on the ship and we've actually left quite a few of them back home as well with Wart Wart who is going to begin making preparations for our city while we're on the topic of cities after defeating this Federation base we would then travel to another nearby city that I don't believe is the capital city per se but it is a very highly populated area with some type of governor or something living here no doubt so as you can imagine we decided to nuke them yeah You'll have to excuse the in-game music, I forgot to turn it off, as well as this massive toxic fallout. Once you drop so many nuclear bombs, I mean, it's basically inevitable. Nobody ever said they were good for your health, after all. But um, before we would continue with our nuclear crusade, Napoleon and his soldiers decide to take a hot moment and sit on the governor's throne. 
Meanwhile, back home, Wartwart and his band of clone soldiers had just landed at the spot for our future city and began making preparations. Said preparations would include us needing to work all throughout the night on deconstructing any runes that we found because we basically need a clear spot for this city so we can at least begin planning it. So that's exactly what we did, tearing down old runes and anything really that got in our way. But because it would be extremely costly in terms of fuel to constantly fly back and forth to the base, we decided to set up a temporary base here inside an ancient danger. And thankfully for us, the only thing that was inside the ancient danger was some insectoids, which we quickly and easily dispatched of. There were also some ancient people sleeping in these cryo sleep caskets, but ah, we didn't worry about them. To kind of help us out with that self-sufficient um, resource utilization, I guess you could say, um, we ended up just using the resources from the runes that we had deconstructed, as well as some steel that we had mined out of the mountains. We didn't go too overboard with the base. Most of these clones and everyone have joy wires and things like that. They're not going to have mental breaks most likely anyway, so we didn't have to make it too perfect. And just like that, after hours upon hours of working on this temporary base, it was finally completed. It was hardly anything more than a glorified hole in the ground that we could sleep in, but at least it was done. Shortly thereafter, though, we ended up receiving a notification of Void Expansion. It looks like they've actually set up some type of fort just outside of our main base. Now, because Wart Wart and our other clones back on our home planet were extremely busy with the city planning as well as taking care of our main base, we ended up requesting some support from our empire. They ended up sending a shuttle that was housing their top-notch strike team. Thanks to our takeover of the Empire, their soldiers have much better training, of course, along with weapons and armor as well. Meaning, of course, this strike team should be able to take out Void on their own. Hopefully. One of the only problems being, because we left with all the nuclear warheads, they don't have any to use, but luckily the Empire does have a small stockpile of anti-grain warheads. They would use this anti-grain warhead to breach the side of the Void base, but unfortunately, as they were trying to infiltrate, the Void soldiers made contact and began killing off some of our Imperials. Thankfully though, our strike team had managed to make it inside where they could try to exploit any vulnerabilities within the Void base. Oh my god. It's Crimson, and it appears that he's returned back home. There's only one person on this planet who can stop him. It's time we put this rabid dog down once and for all. Hello everyone and welcome back to the RimWorld Clone Army series where we open today with Wart Wart who is approaching the Void Base. In his arsenal is a weapon the likes of this planet has yet to see. However, before entering the base he is approached by Corporal Haley of the UNSC. Alongside her is a Marine as well as Sergeant Cole who is looking better than he was before. It would appear that we're not the only ones interested in finding Crimson and Private Ox within this base. Due to the temporary alliance with the UNSC it appears that Wardward Ward is allowing the three of them to travel along with him inside. But do not be mistaken, Wardward Ward has no plans of letting anyone come between him and the justice that he will serve to Crimson and Private Ox. He discovers one of the corpses from the Imperial Task Force, battered and mangled by Crimson's hands no doubt. He rushes inside, and of course he is followed shortly by the other three. Though I am glad to see that Sergeant Cole has been reunited with his sister after what can only be described as a resurrection of of sorts. Little did they know things were really about to heat up for the both of them. In the meantime, Wart Wart would continue his search. Finally. Wartward has been fatally wounded. With time he could recover, but 
Crimson is escaping. We have to use the weapon now. Only on Crimson. Hopefully the others can take care of Ox. As you may have guessed, that was a one-way trip, and unfortunately, Ward Ward did not make it out in one piece, sacrificing himself for the safety of his friends, entire planets, entire star systems and galaxies. They all owe their safety away from the empire that Crimson was building to Ward Ward and his sacrifice. Unfortunately, Private Ox was not found. It's possible that he was never even in the Void base, that Crimson had come alone. He is, of course, the highest sought after target by the UNSC, the Clone Army, and the Shattered Empire, and we will find him. As we celebrate the life and sacrifice of our good friend Commander Wartwart, it is worth noting that his remains were scooped up and placed in this cryosleep casket. And although the remains were charred, burnt, bits and pieces of him, maybe we can bring him back at some point, or utilize him for some type of AI or something. But until then, his remains will stay here in the settlement known as Napoleon City, and of course, this is where we are building our capital city. As you can see already in our capital city, we did build a research lab, which is the same area that Wart Wart's remains are in, but we are currently building a large storage area as well as something of a cafeteria or mess hall. Now the cafeteria slash mess hall was perfect size, I would say. I think we have optimal seating and plenty of room if and when we need to add more tables and chairs. However, our storage room was a bit underestimated, which of course you'll see later on in the video when we end up bringing all of our resources over here to the capital city from the old base. We also took some time to build plenty of housing for our soldiers, and the idea here was going to be that we would do two soldiers to a room just like we did at the base previously. But of course, obviously, we can't be building bedrooms for just the soldiers. We had to give Napoleon his very own room off to the side here next to the laboratory. Now, if I can be honest with you, this room was hardly fit for an emperor of Napoleon's stature, but all of the buildings and whatnot that we're building right now are basically just some low-level infrastructure that we really need to get the city off the ground. Not literally off the ground, of course. <laughs> That'll be in season three when I end up building a space station would save our ship. Too, which is something that everyone has been requesting for a long time and I just want to let you guys know don't think I haven't taken note of that we will definitely be using save our ship to kind of let you guys in on my plans here as we continue with the growth and building of our city my idea is to eventually build this massive capital city here once that is complete we will most likely appoint someone as the king or monarch or something of that sort of this planet while Napoleon and the others go off into space and continue to conquer galaxies and maybe even the universe. Yes, quite ambitious, I know. But of course, before we do any of that, we're going to have to start moving all of our shit from the old base over to the capital city. Unfortunately though, over at the old base, things were happening. Well, that's an extremely vague way of putting it. Things like this portal opening up out of nowhere, a bit concerning. The portals that began opening at the old base had disgusting beasts and creatures crawling out from them, plague bearers and other disgusting demons. This was obviously no doubt the work of the chaos god Nurgle and his filthy slaves like Ox. The bastards immediately began attacking and destroying our defenses, which was devastating because the only clones that we had here was our Omega Squad and a handful of kid clones. Unfortunately, while running to alert the others, Romeo was pinned down by many of these plague demons and creatures. Thankfully though, aware of the situation, Kid Omega came out with her squad and the other clones to begin attacking these beasts and try to fend them off from our base, but unfortunately there were so many of them, and they just kept coming and coming, completely surrounding our defenses. But like the light at the end of a tunnel, the UNSC had sent allies our way. Finally, reinforcements were here to assist us. At first, this was amazing. We thought we were finally beginning to push them back, but unfortunately as the battle 
raged on, the Marines began getting mangled and torn apart by the plague forces, we realized that we were not winning. As the battle raged on, we began taking several losses to our Omega squad, forcing us to try and retreat back to the base. As we did so though, Kid Omega had an idea, a plot of sorts that would end up destroying the plague forces with one fail swoop. We still had nuclear bombs here at the base, we had yet to take them to the capital city. And with one massive fusion bomb, we ended this battle. Finally, we had emerged victorious, defeating the plague forces in battle. Kid Omega really proved herself here as something of a leader, a general, a commander even. And believe me, that has not gone unnoticed by Napoleon and the other clones. But regardless of our victory, the base was extremely weakened, and it no doubt will be constantly raided by waster pirates as well as plague forces. We need to get all our stuff and get back to the capital city where we can try and defend ourselves with our army. Once we had finally done that, which, bear in mind, this took an extremely long time. Even though we have a massive ship, we ended up having a massive amount of resources to carry, and I kept running into issues where the ship would actually land with all the resources, and because it landed, it would destroy so many. We had to make several trips, yada yada yada. It took a really long time, but eventually we did get it done, and we are now putting all of our resources away. This is when I realized that the storage facility that we had built was not big enough. Luckily though, we had built that massive stone cutting building with all the shelves, so I went ahead and freed those up for any type of item. We also went ahead and started building something of a generator room where we would end up keeping all of our void power cells, which is the main and primary source of our energy still, especially here because we couldn't remove all of our solar panels from the previous space, so they're kind of really our bread and butter. Eventually though, of course, I plan on building more advanced solar panels, wind turbines, geothermal, yada yada. But naturally, of course, all good things take time. While we're on the topic of good things, these soldiers here have hardly seen a good bit of recreation in a very long time. So I went ahead and began working on a recreation room for them, which I would fill with billiards tables and poker tables for the time being. I couldn't remember if I'd actually remembered to bring the tube televisions from the old base, so I, I don't know, I'll have to look for those, but for now, this should keep them entertained. But we would continue this glorious work on our our capital city and it did take an extremely long time to do I don't know if I mentioned it recently but I uh, did end up getting a new motherboard for my PC it's made things run a bit smoother I got a new uh, graphics card uh, months back you know I, I've uh, been trying to save up to try and improve my PC to improve basically game and video quality of course um, and uh, even with all that though and just everything in general with the PC this still took a really long time things moved at a complete snail's pace um, um, things have gotten a bit better overall when recording, but just this project in general took a really long time, especially moving all the resources over. That's why I didn't really show any footage of that. I didn't really have any that was worth watching, unfortunately. Um, but the city is coming along extremely nicely. Um, with all that being said, I do want to mention that this is going to be the last episode of Season 2. Now, I know last season, the first season, had a few more episodes, I believe, and a good bit more time than this one, but uh, I really feel like we've accomplished our goals with this. Even if the city isn't exactly perfect and completely up to par, I really just wanted to get it created, get it on its legs, and that way we have plenty more to do in Season 3 with building the city and eventually moving on to Save Our Ship 2, where we build um, a space station, things like that. Um, I also want to mention, of course, if you guys have any ideas for what you'd like to see in Season 3, be sure to let me know. Leave them in the comment section down below and everything. I really appreciate it. But thank you guys, of course, for watching Season 2 of the Clone Army series. I just want to say thank you again. You know, I'm so blessed and just extremely grateful to be able to entertain you guys. It truly is an amazing opportunity to be able to do this and just to have you guys watching this, especially for seasons, let alone episodes, but for seasons. And I just want to say thanks. I couldn't do it without you guys. And this is just as much your series and channel as it is mine. I love you guys ever so much. Not to fear, of course, the clone army will be back, and as will I.